Right, good morning to our wonderful audience and welcome to the BCI Offshore Investment Manager webinar. Olga, thank you again for that lovely music as the introduction. We are truly privileged to have parted with so many leading global fund managers in offering you and your clients access to a range of top global funds and feeder funds. This is the first day of our Global Managers series, uh, extending uh, on Wednesdays and over the next two Wednesdays as well. So other for you, all of you joining in today, it would be great if you can join for the other two days or the next two Wednesdays as well. Uh, as per usual, time and line, we will cover questions received in the Q&A box as far as possible. Uh, for those questions we can't get to, we'll circulate that again to the presenters and try to give you feedback afterwards. Uh, if you want answers to your questions that you can't cover, uh, make sure to add your name if you don't want to be anonymous, uh, and we'll return right back to you with those answers. We will look at uh, some of the known risks out there, and what are some of the key points to focus on looking at the investment period ahead. As you all know, despite massive fears of inflation in 2023, Existing wars and new wars breaking out, markets proved to be remarkably resilient, ending the year with absolutely great returns. The question from a lot of our investors now is, can this hold? Continued talks of global recession still out there, and we know that rates are probably going to stay high for a little bit longer. Uh, yes, expected that central banks and the Fed will pivot sometime during the year. We don't know exactly when. But then again, you know, when they pivot, is that not a sign that some of something in the economy broke? And will it not be too little too late? Yes, we do talk a lot about macros because that is the stuff in the news and that our clients are exposed to on a daily basis. But is it not more sometimes about the fundamentals? The ability for companies to grow earnings despite various market cycles and macroeconomics and geopolitical noise, the price that you pay for quality businesses, finding alternative opportunities like global credit, and ultimately identifying well-experienced, skilled fund managers with the ability to grow clients' wealth. With that all said, it's my absolute privilege to welcome our first speaker for the day, uh, all the way from Jersey, Asset Manager and Founding Member of Martello Asset Management, Gary Hill. Good morning, Gary. I hope this far I found you well. How are you keeping this morning? I'm fine. Thank you, Eugene. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a great day here in Jersey, but I, uh, I understand it's doing very well in Cape Town at the moment. So uh, I'll, I'll look forward to my visit there in May. Yeah, beautiful weather right across South Africa. Isn't it always a bit of a grey day in Jersey? <laughs> this time of the year, this time of the year, it's either fog or rain. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, on on that note, the markets doesn't look all that grey. And uh, again, thank you for your time this morning. It's really great to have you joining us. Uh, you. And you can start with your presentation if you're ready, sir. Yeah, I will do. Thank you, Eugene. I show you my screen. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks for for um, attending today. Uh, the so Martello here in Jersey, we're uh, a boutique asset manager uh, with the investment advisor to the Martello Global Equity Fund in Guernsey. And, uh, and also that's the fund that our, the BCI Martello Global Equity Feeder Fund feeds into. We're a developed market, long only uh, specialist equity house, uh, bottom up, high conviction, style agnostic uh, fund manager. Today's presentation is, is really about as, as the title suggests, what are the options if you feel it's getting a little crowded in the herd? And by that, I mean, not just the, uh, the, the big seven tech stocks, which I guess are on everyone's lips at the moment in terms of uh, their domination of earnings and also uh, leadership in the market in the US, but also perhaps the, uh, the equivalent in terms of the US market relative to the rest of the world as well. So just to start, uh, I think the, the main headline here is really that the lack of breadth in the US equity market is hitting extremes. I think we're all aware of this. Uh, it, it's talked about regularly uh, with lots of different ways of measuring it. 
Um, the, this slide here on the left suggests that you know three three of the stocks in the in the Magnificent Seven are now equivalent to the market cap of you know practically all of Europe uh, uh, by themselves, uh, notwithstanding the other stocks in that basket as well. Uh, and mega cap tech stocks are now outperforming small cap stocks by the largest margin since the the peak of the dot com bubble. So we're talking about extremes. Uh, I don't think there's any any getting away from that. Clearly, the, the the earnings profile of companies during the the tech bubble and the uh, the, the magnificent seven uh, today are very different, uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So, to a certain extent, some of that um, that perhaps um, that bubble comparison isn't isn't truly uh, um, fair because of the very early nature of the earnings cycle for companies 20, 24 years ago. Having said that, we can't get away from the fact that. Um, some of the returns that we're seeing at the moment are, are at extremes as well. So the, the, the chart on the right-hand side shows the, um, the return of the, the NASDAQ in different periods of uh, in, uh, bond yield direction over the last 20 or 30 years or so. You can see in 2022, the, um, the NASDAQ did fall quite heavily at a time when yields were heading higher due to the um, post-COVID um, uh, desire to tighten monetary policy, et cetera. 2023, we had a very strong year for NASDAQ um, uh, when bond yields actually did nothing at all, moved, moved very little. But so far this year, we, and this is extrapolating the, the returns from the first year outwards, you can see that the, um, the returns generated by the NASDAQ uh, over the, the start of this year, are they're actually more extreme than this chart shows because this was done a, a week or so ago. So we are talking about a level where both the, the concentration of, the, of the, uh, the market and also the returns being generated by a handful of stocks are, are definitely at extreme levels. Uh, so on the earnings side, you know, you know, to a certain extent, some of this can be justified by the very strong earnings that these companies have produced over the last year, um, perhaps starting from a, a fairly low sort of starting point in terms of comparison. Uh, but what this does highlight is that despite the fact that those companies generated great um, uh, earnings and, and, and results over the last year, the market itself is, is kind of discounting the, the earnings of the other 493 and almost penciling them in as being um, very weak, which really isn't the case. And our bottom-up process and the, the work we do on the underlying uh, results of, of a, a number of companies in, in sectors which have really been neglected over the last year or so which suggests that that isn't the case either. So the, the focus has very much been on the earnings of, of seven companies and a lot of neglect, I think, really on the earnings of, of the remainder of the market. That's in the US and it equally applies to, to, um, to Europe as well. Um, Again, another way of looking at this is the, is the forward PE on, on the Magnificent Seven. You can see it was actually higher during 21 and 22 um, as a result of the, uh, the very strong performance of, uh, of, of shares during the COVID period in this sector. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we're at a level now which is still a long way above average. Uh, and the expected sales growth um, going forward uh, is still very high for those companies. It's, we're talking about compound annual uh, growth in sales of actually 12% for the next three years versus only 3% for the rest of the market. So again, this, 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 um, this case being made that um, you know, sales growth expectations for these companies is extremely high uh, and extremely low for, for a large sector of the market. And you can see now on the right-hand side how the, the differential between earnings and sales suggests that some of this is now uh, at an extreme too. So the expectations for earnings um, going forward uh, are, are at a, a, an exceptionally high level uh, with a very high bar being set um, on, on the basis of the results being generated over the last year. Um, the actual results from, from a number of these companies over the last quarter have been, have been very good, I have to say. Um, Meta, Amazon, Google, and Apple all beat expectations quite handsomely. Uh, but they, you know, the, the outlook for the, the, the expectation for their ongoing um, uh, consensus sort of sales growth is, is extremely high as well. Uh, at the same time, there's an expectation that their margins are going to increase further from, from where they are now over the next two or three years. So where does this put us? It, effectively, in, in our mind, it puts us in, in a situation where the US is now a tale of two markets. Um, the S&P 500, the Dow and NASDAQ all hitting highs based upon the inclusion of uh, certain of those stocks in, the, in, in their um, indices. 
but the uh, the majority of the market is not at an all time high at all. And you can see that you know the majority of sectors that, that we look at, as well as alongside tech, it, it are, are are nowhere near their high points. And in fact, are trading on, on quite low PEs relative to the the market overall. Also in Europe. Europe has benefited over the last um, three or four months uh, post the pivot in bond yields in, in uh, October last year, uh, and European shares have made a move higher uh, to, a, to a new 20-year high. But on a, a relative valuation basis, uh, on a forward PE, they're, they're trading at, the, at a record low discount to, to, the, um, uh, to the US. Uh, and and also at a you know quite a long way below the the, the discount that they traded at uh, um, pre-COVID as well. So we do feel that there's plenty of opportunity within the European market at present for there to be um, uh, lots of interesting, uh, good, uh, um, and profitable ideas within that market. Uh, if you so feel that uh, there's a time and a place to actually start rotating the exposure away from the the, the more expensive US. So just turning to that theme further, so what we've seen over the last couple of months is a, a growing consensus amongst forecasters and fund managers that, that leadership will develop in, 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 in non-US uh, uh, markets and also in the laggards of the US market as well over the course of this year. We have seen um, signs of that happening uh, in, in, in certain areas on a stock-specific basis. Uh, we've seen some great results from companies such as American Express, uh, Procter & Gamble, uh, Carrier Group, um, across different industries, across different sectors in the US, which are, which are quite high and, and well, well above expectation. So we think there's an early start to that happening. Um, if you look at the, the earnings expectations forecast for the majority of the, the global markets um, for the rest of this year, you can see that the bar is very low for Europe relative to the rest of the world. Uh, which, which to us is is great. It means that there's perhaps you know a little bit of um, there's a great deal of opportunity there. There's a, a little bit of neglect, I think, in terms of the the potential for that and, and companies within that um, those markets to to perform well. Uh, and it, it's part of the reason why, as a company, we have a, a, a significant overweight to Europe, Switzerland, UK, Scandinavia in our portfolio at present. Uh, I think the the rationale for for th this change of leadership to happen isn't just perhaps a little bit of fatigue over the uh, the performance of uh, an ownership of the of the magnificent seven uh, over the last year but also that we do expect uh, some improvement in global economic growth over the course of 24 um, particularly in Europe relative to its performance last year where it practically stagnated for the second half of the year uh, and also uh, from areas such as the emerging markets in China where um, you know demand growth and trade with Europe will increase um, on the back of that. And given the, the composition of the, the European uh, equity market, we'll feel, we'll feel that there's plenty of companies in that market which are well placed to benefit from, from that, uh, that outcome. We've talked about supportive monetary easing. Uh, you know, at the, end of the, at the end of last year, there was an awful lot of optimism um, baked in in terms of how many rate cuts we would have. Over, over what time period. Uh, I think, you know, as we've seen over the last couple of weeks, that the strong labor market in the US has pushed some of those expectations back from March until towards the end of the second quarter. Uh, it may well be that it is a year that uh, we have to be patient in terms of waiting for that to happen because of the, the ongoing strong uh, performance of the US economy uh, and, and not giving the Fed perhaps the, the signal it needs to, to start cutting rates just yet. Uh, an upturn in commodity prices, well, that would be welcome. It's, it's, it's a possibility within certain sectors, I think, uh, notwithstanding the fact that there, there seems to be a continued um, uh, low expectation for industrial metal prices to improve this year. Uh, but we, we do think that there are, there are pockets of, of uh, opportunity within the commodity space which will allow that to happen. Um, and also as well on the back of all of this is, is the expectation, I think, that the, the US dollar will, will trend lower as the year goes on. So overall, we expect this to lead to a more favorable cyclical conditions for ex-US earnings during 24. Uh, and also because of the, the sector composition in a lot of the markets we do look at outside of the US, uh, that's, uh, that should be beneficial for, for many of the companies based there.
So looking at Europe, I mean, Europe clearly has disappointed over the last five years in terms of contribution towards world equity performance. Um, Notwithstanding the fact that you know, our, our, during this period here, we had a strong period of performance, which has been given back during um, the summer uh, of last year. But I think the case we would make is that at the index level, that, that has been the case. But individually, from a bottom-up perspective, there have been you know, some excellent stock opportunities and performances from companies based in Europe over that time period. So this is a chart showing performance of a, of a handful of stocks that we own in the portfolio over three years. Uh, the index at 23.5% 23 uh, in dollar terms over that three-year period, uh, and handsome app performance from ASML, uh, Airbus, uh, Vanshi, SAP, and UBS over that as well. Uh, over a shorter time period since perhaps the end of September last year when we had the, the sort of signal on the Fed pivot, you know, it's, all, it's also been a case that those stocks have performed incredibly well over the short term uh, as they've benefited from um, uh, perhaps the rally going on in tech, so ASML and SAP have both been great beneficiaries from you know, interest in European tech companies um, during that period, but also as well Airbus as an example, uh, taking market share from, from Boeing and producing some uh, record levels of uh, uh, earnings and, and order, orders uh, looking forward as well. Um, just to, to highlight three of those in particular, <clears throat> ASML, uh, a specialist in semiconductor manufacturing equipment <clears throat> based out of the Netherlands, but clearly a, a global market leader, <clears throat> almost with a monopoly position in terms of the, the hardware it produces for, uh, uh, for chip manufacturing. Uh, very, very strong revenue performance over the last three years uh, and uh, very good use of cash uh, within its um, operating uh, structure as well, which, we're, which, which we monitor quite closely. Uh, excellent growth in free cash flow. Uh, and also spending on R&D with the future in mind. Uh, revenue net income have grown exponentially over the last decade with very, very strong margins as well. And return on equity has been fantastic for the company over the last year. Um, secondly, SAP. This has been a long-term holding in our strategy. Uh, it's, again, a, a leading global company in enterprise management software, uh, very dominant in its sector. Uh, it switched to cloud delivery of its of its software applications some years ago, and it's benefiting enormously from that uh, in terms of margin and profitability. Uh, and over, on its recent uh, earnings statement as well, it's 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 you know declared that it's going to be investing a billion euros this year and next um, into AI within the organisation to help in terms of improving profit productivity further delivery of their software. Uh, and also it'll, it'll lead to uh, um, cost savings in terms of um, uh, employers as well uh, as a result of that. So there'll be a restructuring there too. But yeah, the company's performing very well relative to its sector. Uh, and you know, again, one of the companies that we like in terms of its cash management. Uh, and finally, um, Vanshi, this is a, a European-based um, uh, leader in, um, it's an industrial company, builds very large infrastructure projects globally, uh, looks after the management of airports, uh, toll roads, uh, other big large infrastructure projects um, uh, and um, assets across the world. Very, very strong order book um, for, 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 for projects. Again, it, it's managed its debt incredibly well through, um, through many parts of the cycle. Uh, revenue and profit, profit growth has been exceptionally well over the last decade. In fact, they, 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 they actually was, um, announced their results today, but they had a pre-announcement pre where they, they raised their free cash flow generation for last year significantly on the back of uh, very strong uh, operational uh, performances last year. So again, uh, you know, we, we, you know, these are examples of very, very high quality uh, global leading companies based out of Europe that have um, incredible uh, market position in the, in the areas that they operate in. So finally, in summary, um, we would say that, you know, global equity returns in 23 were defined by the extraordinary rise in, in this Magnificent Seven stocks, which perhaps should now be the Magnificent Six, given that Tesla is, seems to be falling out of that, uh, uh, that basket at the moment. <clears throat> Does the argument that these companies are too big to fail hold water against a backdrop of gradually easing monetary conditions and steady or improving global growth this year. Um, the divergence in performance, the M7, that is starting to happen. People are becoming more differentiated in terms of their views on the successful ones within the basket. Uh, so we hold one or two of them, but we don't hold the, the basket in total, preferring to look for opportunities outside of that right now. Uh, 
And so we, again, just in, in, in conclusion, we think that European earnings beta should be supported by the anticipated upturn in global manufacturing and trade this year. Uh, and that the low hurdle for, for European earnings expectations coupled with this uh, low sort of regional ownership uh, presents a great opportunity for uh, alpha generation at the stock level in Europe um, going forward. Uh, I'll leave it at there, Eugene. I think that's my my time. Pretty much. Yeah, Gary, you've you've done very well with time. I don't see any questions from the audience. Maybe just very quickly from my side. I uh, part of Martello's uh, investment process and philosophy. One of the statements that you make. Uh, and it speaks a little bit more to your investment process, I suppose, in selecting these companies. Uh, you state that, you know, you, you look at to identify the best company in the best sector in the best market. Yes. How do you know what is the best market and the best company? How do you go about that? Yeah, that, 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 that's very much the, um, the stock screening process that we, that we, uh, that we've developed over the years, which allows us to screen for certain metrics, certain financial metrics in all of the companies in our universe uh, by sector. Um, they, they've remained the same actually over the 20 odd years we've been doing this. Uh, we then use that uh, as, as a way of aggregating that, that information, displaying it in a, in a graphical form and allowing us to look at 20 years worth of financial data, which we believe um, uh, is the DNA of a successful company. Uh, and by doing that across sectors, we can then uh, determine which of those companies within each sector we feel are, are the best four or five, for instance, uh, in that particular sector. That then goes into our, our uh, sort of investment committee decision making process, whereby we then construct portfolios from those ideas. We then monitor, obviously, the, the ongoing earnings um, and, and sales data of the companies on a quarterly basis. And we have a, a momentum um, analysis on the uh, on eight of those factors on a quarterly basis as well as the the graphical information we use to track um the the the, the, the stocks within their sector and the and the stocks within the overall market as well so it's it's an ongoing process it never ends uh, but it, it allows us to see a lot of information about a lot of companies uh, in in, a, in one place very quickly uh, and uh, and be and be confident that the ones that we're owning are the ones which are leading within their specific sectors on a, on an ongoing basis Gary, I know this was a very short space in time. You covered a lot of ground, so thank you so much for that. Uh, it was great to have you on the sessions, uh, sharing your views and insights of Martello Asset Management. Uh, to your audience, BCI Martello Global Equity Feeder Fund, available on most of the local platforms. Uh, again, Gary, from our side, thank you so much for your time this morning. And we look forward to seeing a lot more of you in upcoming sessions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eugene. Good stuff. Right. Next up, we have a very well established and a very well known fund manager to all of us here in SA, winner of numerous Raging Bill Awards, Chief Executive Officer and Portfolio Manager Richard Pitt from Blue Alpha Asset Management. Good morning, Richard. How are you doing this morning? Good morning, everyone. And Eugene, thanks very much. I loved your intro because you basically summarized my presentation. Um, and I'm hoping I don't have too many slides that, that Gary just showed, but I guess it does highlight the fact that we're all looking at the same um, <clears throat> data sets, we're looking at the same information, and in some respects, it's quite hard to come up with, with vastly different conclusions. The, um, the title of my, or the theme of my presentation today is, is, is Why Forecast, and perhaps I should actually have called it Why Bother Forecast. And um, the reason I, I sort of thought about this was, you know, it's it's standard for us when we start a new year. Our clients ask us, BCI asks us, everyone asks us, what are what are the expectations for the year? And um, clearly, there's a lot of merit in in terms of thinking about what may or may not happen. But um, the thank you. Should I make the presentation? <laughs> Apologies for that. Um, there's a lot of merit in thinking, you know, about, about the future, but I think the risk is when you conclude some sort of answer, the risk is that you believe that the answer is, is true and valid. And if you look at last year's forecasts, I think the big forecasts were obviously for um, the US to enter a recession at some point. Uh, China, there was hope that there would be a sort of post-COVID reopening boost. 
and there would also be some reversal of the stock bond correlation that we've seen in the last couple of years um, and that kind of would have been premised on the fact that um, um, in a recessionary environment bonds would have done quite well and equities perhaps not so well. What we did see was um, five percent growth in in US GDP in the third quarter and I think um, probably three in the fourth uh, China deflation and the property crisis that's now kind of well entrenched in China um, and in fact you know the bond market up until um, up until the end of October was about to have a down year um, and equities themselves you know hadn't done particularly well un until we had this sort of the big rally in, in the last uh, two months or so we also of course had the magnificent seven up 75% versus 12% for the world index. Um, and last year was the year of obesity and, and AI, specifically with companies like Nova Nordisk um, and in, uh, NVIDIA. So I think what's interesting is if you think about, you know, if you knew what was going to happen last year, and here we're just tracking the world index um, in blue and the volatility index, let's call it as a proxy for risk. Um, <laughs> And you said, okay, in March, there's going to be a regional banking crisis. Shortly after that, Credit Suisse is de facto going to go bust or, or certainly need to be rescued by UBS. Um, the Fed, uh, Fed funds rate was going to go up another four times in the year. 10-year uh, bonds in the US would hit 5%. Um, so all these factors, gold would hit an all-time high. Um, you know, what would your expectations be for the VIX? And I think you would have expected the VIX to be very high, um, sort of point to point, and you also would have expected the world index to be down. So I think, you know, even if you know what's going to happen, it's quite hard to know what the outcome um, will be based on what happens. And so I come to this point about forecasts, and this graph is just showing um, over the last 20 years or so, looking at the uh, strategist forecasts um, for for the world index over time. I think this is the, I think this is the world, either S&P or the world index. And basically you can see um, through time, strategists always forecast, they're always optimistic in their forecasts and they all, they forecast about a 50% above uh, what the actual turns out to be. Uh, what's also interesting is that markets are down about 30% of the time. And in this, certainly in this 20 year look back period, never once uh, did the strategists forecast a down market. But even more interesting, because you have down markets and up markets, the miss factor, if you look at what is that average miss versus their forecast, it's 13%. So it's double the return of the index over time. So that tells us that we should be extremely cautious about making forecasts. And certainly when we hear these forecasts, not, you know, not to pay too much attention to them. So just following on with some current uh, recent useless information, this is Goldman Sachs. A highly respected global bank, and uh, I think most of the banks have similar kind of forecasts. And basically, what they were forecasting for the, um, the S and P in terms of price performance over um, the year ahead was about four percent to mid year and eight percent for the year, which is um, kind of alarmingly close to the historic nine percent prediction through time. So you might expect, based on the poor performance historically, that, that banks and strategists would, would kind of give up on this endeavor, but it seems still we're quite committed to making these um, focus, focus forecasts. Now, the problem with forecasts is that even if you know what's going to happen, as I said, strange things do happen. So here we show the Fed funds rate through time over the last two years. We've had, um, I think it's 12, um, 11 or 12 rate hikes through that time. Um, the dark blue line is the gold market. Now, if you were told that um, funding costs were going to go up a lot, the expectation would be that the gold price would go down. And in fact, quite the opposite has happened. Um, here you can see it's shown quite strong performance. Um, and towards the end of last year, the gold price hit an all-time high. So that's an unusual occurrence. Um, it's also interesting that the U.S. banking index and I've already mentioned there were problems in, in the banking sector, um, but you'd also expect banks to do well in, a, in an environment of raising interest rates because they, they earn more in terms of their banking operations. 
And then finally, the old story about um, value versus growth, which is the gray line. Um, we've, you know, we've all heard over and over and over again how when interest rates go up, that is good for the value versus growth trade. And in fact, um, that was the case for us a short period of time, and that has totally unwound over the last year. So be careful, I guess, what you know to be true, because often it isn't true. So this leads us on to the kind of everything rally that uh, we saw in the last roughly two months of last year that has continued a little bit into this year. And equities, bonds, um, growth stocks, quality stocks, even Bitcoin went up, gold went up. And this shows the performance of both equities and bonds, and then on a combined basis, um, one year following the, the, the final Fed hike. So, the, so if rates are going to be cut, then the final Fed hike would have been towards the end of July last year. And um, what you can see is that the returns are front-loaded. So generally, the market looks ahead. If there is a, um, a view that the Fed is done with, with hiking rates and the next move is downwards, there's a lot of return in, in the beginning, which partially explains this huge rally that we've seen across the board. Of course, like with all stories, there are some risk factors. Um, and I would just draw you to the bottom two lines. This, this kind of just shows different periods um, from the last Fed rate hike. And the two standout points are obviously 99-2000, where two years later, returns were actually down significantly. And we know that was the tail end of the dot-com dot, uh, dot bubble. And the other one being 2004-2006, the financial crisis, um, and kind of post-commodity boom phase that we had. So it depends. I, I guess the whole point now in terms of how we interpret the Fed cycle has a lot to do with what kind of environment um, are we going into. So if forecasts are not reliable um, and, the, and the future is very uncertain, the question is how do we deal with this? And I've spoken about this many times. You know, you, you kind of fit yourself into a bucket. You're either a value guy, person, or you're a quality investor, um, or you're a growth investor. And I thought this kind of pictorially summarized it quite nicely in the fact that you, you know, you can have good and cheap. You can have quality and value, but it's not going to have growth. I guess in the local environment, that would be kind of like a ETI. You can have fast and good, high quality, um, good growth. It's not going to be cheap. Um, ASML, um, NVIDIA, Nova Nordisk. You know, those are the kind of companies that would fit into that category. And then you can have cheap and fast um, companies that are growing a lot. They appear quite cheap, but they're not good. Um, typically, those are businesses which have been patched together with acquisitions. So the underlying returns are not that, that great, and, and eventually that ends in tears. So you need to pick your poison in terms of what you think works. We are, um, as we've communicated consistently over the years, we are quality investors because we think that's the starting point of all value creation. Um, and this was floating around recently. And I think it speaks to a common theme that, you know, quality investing uh, is just not going to work anymore. And the problem is that everyone loves a quality compounder, but it's, it's reflected in the prices. And so there's this uh, narrative of, you know, the place to make money is, is in value. Now, if I can just remind you of this chart, which I also show frequently, because um, like a lot of good things, it doesn't go out of style. And it really just speaks to underlying returns of businesses over different measurement periods. And uh, to summarize it, what, it's, what, what this graph tells us is that there is a lot more stickiness in the underlying return metrics, in this case, return on invested capital, um, than what the market gives companies sort of... Um, than what the market will acknowledge. So things don't just automatically revert to the mean. Um, and I guess we're seeing this in, in, in some cases with uh, the likes of, a, of the Magnificent Seven. Now, when we think about investing, I'll just remind you all, um, it's ultimately value is the present value of cash flows. It can be nothing else. Uh, cash flows must be a function of quality or the return, the excess return over the cost of capital. 
And to the extent that you can grow as well, reinvest in your business, you will add more cash flows. And so opportunities can only be the extent to which you buy the discount to the value. So the, the questions are really, does the company generate good returns? Can it grow? And what do you have to pay for it? Um, so in terms of our approach, it's always worthwhile looking at, at the facts and saying, does, does this approach work? Um, and this is our performance over since inception. Um, and basically, if, um, you know, I think uh, the world index, let me see our world index is a, a tougher index to beat than what, than what people think. Um, we know that most managers don't come anywhere close. Our fund has beat it in different periods. Uh, these numbers go back to December, but in fact, if we take the one-year number to January, we're now ahead of the world index. And um, the, the fund is ranked in the top quartile across almost every measurement period versus its peer group, um, barring one where I think it's second quartile. So we say this approach has shown um, over quite a long period of time, going back almost 10 years now, uh, we will have our 10-year anniversary in September of delivering good returns to investors. Um, and it's based on good commercial economic sense. We always get questions about quality. Yes, you guys are quality investors and quality is done very well. Um, and that's a valid point. So here we just show our performance um, against a uh, a quality proxy, if you will, Morgan Stanley US Quality Index, which is the light blue line and our performance. And pleasingly, you can see that through time, not all the time, but generally through time, we have managed to add <clears throat> enormous amount of value above the kind of um, straightforward quality index. So going forward, <clears throat> how, you know, what, what are the opportunities going to be? I think what we are looking for is we are looking for um, we're looking for gaps. So we're looking for things that are not playing out as we would expect them to. If a company is doing very well, growing its earnings, coming out with positive announcements, and the share price is going up, well, that's kind of what you would expect. And there's a lot of that in the market. The gaps are where um, things are going quite well at an operating level. Uh, the business is, itself is doing quite well, but the share price performance is lagging. And <clears throat> we have a small position in Alibaba. We have had for some time, but this highlights kind of the ideas that we are looking for. And here you can see the share price, um, the dark line versus its trailing earnings <clears throat> and its forecast earnings. So obviously very, very 50,000 foot high level view that, you know, here we think is a classic example of we know that the Chinese story has become mostly uninvestable for people. And I guess the, the big question going forward is China, is the value opportunity or is it a value trap? There are some good businesses that have been brushed with the, um, they've been tainted with the China brush. And you know these are the kind of examples that we're looking for to try and um, add value for our, for our clients going forward. I think Gary touched on a similar kind of chart to this, and it's obviously one of the big questions. I think anyone who runs a portfolio of stock that aims to beat the index has to deal with this question. Um, and it's essentially, you know, what do you think the Magnificent Seven is? Is it an asset class? Is it a duration play? Um, Non-cyclical, defensive growth? Maybe it's momentum, maybe it's a bubble. The performance of these stocks, um, given the size of their weighting, and here we're just showing it versus country weights, just to put it into perspective, is so enormous that I think for a lot of active managers, how they do versus the index will have a lot to do with the performance of these stocks going forward. And then just on this um, often repeated story about how expensive the US is, um, you know, it's, it's simply not a true story. If you take out the Magnificent Seven and Netflix um, and you look at the rest of the S&P, sure, they, it, it may not be extremely cheap, but it's not uh, tremendously expensive versus history. And the, the rating of the rest of the market is substantially lower than these um, mega cap Magnificent Seven stocks. So, you know, simple stories, again, 
uh, you need to sort of dig under the bonnet a little bit. I think a big question for all of us is about inflation. And I apologize for the chart crime here, but um, this just tracks our current CPI um, stats versus the 70s. And, and the big risk, <clears throat> or what happened in the 70s was um, in, the, in the early part of the 70s, inflation started tracking down. <clears throat> uh, central bankers started reducing rates, and that led to a huge resurgence in inflation um, later on. And, and as we now know, um, a huge response from the Fed in terms of rates. So I think this is a big thing to follow. Um, there are a lot of factors which could contribute towards inflation going forward. We know about the conflict in the Red Sea. Uh, we know about nationalism. You know, we know about geopolitical risks. Um, China, Taiwan, these are all things that, that potentially could be hindrances in terms of inflation going forward. At the same time, I think AI potentially could have a huge, um, huge effect in terms of productivity over the next five to 10 years. So uh, it's very hard to know how this will play out, but it's certainly important to watch. So these are our key thoughts for 2024. 20, uh, the, the Fed is likely, likely done raise, um, hiking rates. I mean, the, the Fed story is kind of a big consensus story. So I guess the real risk is that the, um, the rate cuts don't come as the market is expecting. It seems that March is now off, off the table. Um, spoken about inflation, U.S. equity is somewhat expensive versus history, but um, you know, not not terribly so. Bond yields for bond investors are twenty-year highs across sectors, so potentially quite interesting. Huge geopolitical risks, which the market for now seems to be looking through. And then we have a U.S. election, which I think will mostly be noise, not really worth um, spending too much thinking about. So some final thoughts, um, and. and uh, I think maybe Gary spoke about it or, or Eugene. I mean, in the long run, it's all about earnings. And so, yes, you know, the rating factor can be quite substantial on earnings, but um, in terms of the underlying investments, what you need to think about is the quality of the businesses and their ability to grow their earnings. And I'm not talking about accounting chemistry here, I'm talking about their real cash flow earnings. If they do that, then through time, um, investors should do fine. And I think the other point is to, you know, we, it's very easy for all of us in the moment to operate on a tactical level and you need to think strategically. And this is a chart that you, I'm sure, would have all seen before, just showing the difference between owning um, uh, the market after up days versus owning it after down days. And it's kind of, um, you know, it's quite amazing. If you think about it, people generally want to buy the market when it's up a bit. And when markets start going down, you know, they want to reduce exposure. So I think very, very important to think strategically and not tactically. This is apparently what SA managers think um, in terms of which asset class do you expect to perform? Um, um, mostly skewed towards local bonds. I'd be quite surprised if that's the case in a year's time, but let's see. Um, then local equities. From our side, um, this is an offshore a global conference or, or webinar, um, but I think the big opportunities are still very much offshore, and that's that's the place to to try and focus a lot of your investing firepower. So uh, with that, I'll wrap it up. It's uh, on February the tenth is the year of the um, year of the dragon, which I believe is the only um, mythical creature in the in the Chinese years, and. I believe it is forecast to bring opportunities, changes, and challenges, which sounds like every other year in the market. Um, so I hope out of the changes and challenges, uh, you can all find the opportunities. And I will end it there. Thank you. Uh, Richard, thank you so much for that. I had a couple of smiles for your presentation, and they're ending on a high note there. Uh, I know we're very much out of time. Very, very quick question, uh, and it maybe speaks to another example of you know finding companies with really good earnings. Very interesting holding that you've got at the moment. My numbers may be uh, not as accurate as yours. My stuff is about a month, two months old. Uh, BlackRock, still a big holding in your fund. Uh, and why a company like BlackRock? It, and again, it, it speaks to your holdings being, I think, very different to a lot of managers out there. 
Well, you know, I think a lot of active managers wouldn't be able to hold BlackRock uh, because it's totally divergent to their opinion of themselves. But I think the facts speak for themselves. <laughs> Passive management generally overwhelms active managers. Now, I mean that, you know, so these are divergent opinions. How do you hold that opinion and still run around as a as a as an active manager? But that's certainly what I believe. And the you know, the evidence bears it out. Um, I think BlackRock is one of those businesses that in its own ways, benefiting from network effects, the bigger get bigger and stronger. And um, yeah, it's not it's not the most exciting idea that we have, but it's you know it's been in our top ten. Um, things have changed a bit. I think our largest position is is currently Meta, um, and obviously that has a lot to do with its recent price performance. So you know we don't we don't explicitly take massive bets on any particular stock. We tend to spread it around. Um, because, as I said, it's it's very hard to know at the beginning of the year where your returns will come from. You tend to be surprised. Richard, thank you so much. For, you're very much out of time. Uh, you're indeed, and this is maybe an uh, intro to my next presenter, but you are definitely living proof that active managers can beat the benchmark. Richard, thank you so much again for your time. Always great to have you on any of our sessions. And uh, looking you, forward Jim. to speaking to you again very shortly. Thank you so much. It's a lot. Thank you. With that said, our next presenter up uh, speaking to the theme may be a little bit incorrect, but we can debate that passive investing. Uh, a great welcome to Anthony Ginsberg, Managing Director of Kings Global. Uh, Anthony, thank you so much for joining us today, all the way from Los Angeles, California. Uh, if my Calculations are right. It's yeah. just before midnight where you are. Yeah. yeah. Good morning, Eugene. It's great to connect with you and uh, your colleagues. Uh, yeah, greeting from uh, stormy California. Happy to go through <laughs> the latest updates from here. Um, I believe your colleagues are going to help me go through some of the slides. The, my main theme, Eugene, is why is this mega trend of global indexing? And Richard probably did my presentation for me, the likes of BlackRock and others that we partner with. Why are they eating the active manager's lunch? And the stock picker's myth increasingly has become mythical over the last couple of years, not just with the Magnificent Seven being so difficult to time and to beat, but it's not just down to diversification and low cost, which is a lot of what people think about indexing. They think it's boring. It's just about low cost and uh, uh, broad diversification, but actually the performance is actually very exciting. So perhaps we can get onto the next slide. I'm gonna take you briefly through what BCI have done with us. It's been a great success. Thank you very much. We're just over 800 million uh, Rand in less than two years with you guys. And uh, we're very encouraged to see the adoption of, of passive and of indexing. We obviously use the MSCI world as our broad building block and benchmark, and it's approaching close to 1600 shares in the developed world. The US dominates, it's actually 70% today. Believe it or not, when we started, uh, over 20 years ago, the U.S. was just over about 42% weighting in the MSCI. So that tells you something, not just about the Magnificent Seven, but how the U.S. has recovered over the last decade and a half since 2008 and the crisis there. And I'm going to have a slide just to show you what's happened since then. Uh, it's incredibly difficult to time these markets. It's really time in the markets. Uh, I think Richard had a slide showing if you miss uh, the crucial 15 or 20 days of the year, you really lose out on much of the gains. So we've partnered over the years with one of BlackRock's main competitors, actually. It's a firm that's 200 years old at State Street, and they are a massive uh, index provider globally, primarily to pension funds and retirement plans. And perhaps we can just go to the next slide. I'd like to talk a little bit about why the U.S. continues to grow. It's not just the Magnificent Seven. Uh, I just saw an article this morning in Business Day there, uh, Eugene, about a tr something like a trillion rand has left. Uh, the JSE in the bond market over the last decade, the business day or reporting this morning. And I think the, the converse is true here in the States. With the 401k plans and retirement plans, pension plans, the U.S. has become the safe haven. And if you go back to 2008 and the crisis, if you look in yellow, the MSCI world today is now 70% represented by the U.S. So if you had excluded the U.S., which is the bottom line there, the, the white line, that shows MSCI excluding the US. You basically would have lost half of your value by just excluding the US. By including the US in the MSCI world, you've participated 
in whether it's Meta, Facebook, it's Nvidia, it's Apple, uh, the, the size of those holdings are relatively small. So the risk of the Magnificent Seven when you hold it in an MSCI index, generally the, the largest weighting, which is Apple Computer and Microsoft today, they're neck and neck, are just around 4% of the MSCI world each. Then you go down to something like NVIDIA and around 3%, um, uh, things like Meta, uh, even Tesla are a lot smaller. So ultimately the, the weightings uh, on these large players is relatively small in the grand scheme of things. The key issue is, is that you can't ignore the US and a lot of the prognosticators, the forecasters all got uh, last year wrong. I just wanted to, before we jump into what's happened here in the US, since I'm sitting here, I thought I'd share some, some thoughts about the outlook for the year. The MSCI world is almost 25% IT, uh, but that includes things like streaming and Netflix. It's including a lot of other broad-based issues such as online gaming, it's not strictly speaking just semiconductors and uh, you know, some boring technology. It's really a lot of disruptive uh, tech, I would say. If you look at the second place weighting there, you'll have financials at about 15%, and then you've got healthcare, industrials, uh, consumer staples, energy. So it's a broad swath of different sectors, and that's why it's generally used as a core building block. It's not to say people can't use uh, blends of active and passive. And that's what we see in the States. Uh, we see most of the large pension funds, the biggest being CalPERS here in California, they all generally are using indexing as a core building block. And MSCI World is generally the mainstream, broadest building block that they utilize. So I'll move on to the next slide, uh, just to try and show you the returns last year. The MSCI essentially did 24% uh, annualized last year. But if you go out five years and 10 years, you find, in US dollar terms, the MSCI world would have given you almost a 13% annualized return over five years and close to a 9% annualized return over 10 years. And this is in US dollar terms. So it's been tremendous. And again, this is one of the core reasons beyond just low cost. We're in the 35 uh, basis point um, TR fee. And of course, you get broad diversification, close to 1,600 stocks. But really, the performance is ultimately what is driving this mega trend of flows out of active into passive over the last two decades. With that, let's move on to the next slide. And just to give you an outset from here in the US, not only do you see lots of Teslas being driven all over the show in places like California, having a lot of charging stations, despite Tesla being a, a, having some struggles over the last month or two, but really many people um, undercut the US for the wrong reasons last year, thinking there'd be recession, uh, and lots of other problems. In fact, inflation has fallen below 3% essentially now. Uh, we had 3.3% GDP growth in the fourth quarter. Um, unemployment is at a record low of just about 3.5%. We're expecting three Fed rate cuts starting probably in May. Uh, the good news about a US election, incidentally, is that you typically have a rising market because the Fed typically is quite uh, stimulative and that doesn't do anything silly like raising rates or um, uh, causing recession during the election year. So typically speaking, it's actually a good year for the stock market because the Fed gets out of the way. They typically will try to do the rate cuts well ahead of um, the election. They don't want to be seen as being partisan towards the uh, incumbent president who currently, of course, is a Democrat. Um, I have to say that uh, because Trump looks like he's got a better than even chance of coming back, despite a lot of people's uh, worries, the Republicans in this country uh, are typically backed more by the business community. And that is seen as a positive, I have to say, for uh, tax reductions and also for um, essentially the, the corporate sector tends to be more supportive of the Republican agenda. Uh, last week, we saw very, very positive returns and, and earnings from Microsoft Amazon Meta, of course, had the first dividend in 20 years and also a massive share buyback of $50 billion. Uh, so that's also helped propel a number of these Magnificent Seven again, even though uh, lots of prognosticators, uh, Eugene, just a few weeks ago, were writing off the Magnificent Seven uh, at the end of December, saying that they'd had their run and it was time to exit uh, stage left. But of course, um, they would have been premature because we've actually had quite a good run already over the first five weeks of the year for many of them. And we don't see this as a tech bubble. These tech companies have got massive cash reserves. It's very, very different to 
what some old timers like myself will remember in 1999 or 2000. Um, it can't really be compared. These are global uh, empires in many cases, and they are very diversified. They're being largely boosted by AI, uh, cloud computing. Uh, it's incredibly uh, diversified under the hood. If you actually take a look at where Amazon's earnings are coming from, it's not from your wife or my wife or your husband uh, buying up uh, tons of stuff in the driveway. Um, actually, in fact, their the cloud computing, AWS, is generating almost half of their profits. So um, the point really is with Microsoft buying the, one of the biggest gaming companies, online gamers, that they acquired Activision quite recently, they're diversifying both into digital entertainment, also into social media. So a lot of these guys are in, very broad in um, their exposure. We'll go on to the next couple of slides. And I think I, I just want to say one thing about the US market. The pension money and the amount of 401k money on a monthly basis that needs to find a home uh, propels money into the stock market. There's a massive equity culture here. Your average dentist or doctor, they all know about ETFs. They know about passive versus active. And I would largely say the likes of Morningstar and others have become very mainstream here in showing transparency on performance. And that's partly what's driven this mega trend move into indexing uh, you know, away from active as the transparency uh, of so few firms typically beating the benchmark. We've seen in America, particularly 90% of fund managers failing uh, miserably, frankly, to beat the S&P 500 and, and the MSCI world. So I'll just move on to the next slide and say that indexing generally is used as the core part, and there's certainly an exploration or a satellite part where active uh, is adopted. So it's typically a blend. Uh, when you look at the South African managers uh, struggling with global equity performance, the recent S&P study showed that close to 97% of South African fund managers were not beating the, the global equity benchmark. This was an S&P study um, basically going back five years. Uh, I want to just show you that they're in good company with uh, European and American and even Australian fund managers when it comes to trying to beat the MSCI. The next slide will show you uh, just how difficult that is. Um, here in the States, if you go across on this bar chart from one year over to 20 years, you'll see the orange are the underperforming funds and the gray part, or might be light blue where you are, shows just how many of these underperforming funds, as you move from left to right, the orange part increasingly gets consumed by the gray part and they get merged or closed out of existence, the underperformers. So by the time you look over 15 to 20 years, you see a massive number, close to 80%, basically being closed or merged uh, by uh, the weaker fund managers, essentially uh, the underperformers. We'll just go on to the next slide, which reiterates part of this. Uh, in the, If you look at the pie chart, you'll see over 30 years, according to the S&P, 60% almost, it says 59% in the pie chart did not survive. And of the remaining 40%, 51% basically underperformed. So you're left with about 10%, the needle in the haystack essentially, who have survived and also outperformed. It's very, very, very difficult. And what I should also mention is because interest rates are coming down in the States, you'll find more money later this year we're expecting huge swaths of the money market there's estimations of seven to eight trillion dollars sitting on the sidelines and one has to wonder where is that money going to go uh, yes some of it will go into bonds but the vast majority of pension and retirement portfolios goes into to equity so one has to imagine that um, with the fed cooperating they're under a lot of pressure from the biden administration to reduce rates already in March, it's not going to happen. I think Richard mentioned that as well, but let's call it, uh, it's going to happen in May or June. We're expecting three rate cuts uh, throughout the year, possibly a fourth one at the end of the year. So um, it, it's all boding well, not just for growth stocks, which do better. And that's one of the reasons we saw significant upside last year, because uh, as inflation came down massively in America from over 9% down to the 3% level, if we get a, an increasing range of 2% handles on inflation, that's very positive for growth stocks, including many of the tech players. And we feel indexing is a safer way to actually play tech. You don't have to be overexposed to it in the sense that um, you know, it's broadly diversified. Frankly, it's, it's a global play uh, tech as well. So it's reasonably well represented in, in the MSCI world to the tune of uh, just over 20 uh, 
4% weighting. We'll move on to the next couple of slides uh, very briefly. Uh, on the right hand side, you'll just see that close to 90% of uh, active fund managers in America failed to beat the S&P 500, which is the large cap. But even if you go into small cap and mid cap and other areas in the US market, more and more uh, pension funds have basically thrown up their hands in this country and said, you know, we're going to use the index basically as our building block, our core, and then we'll put um, you know, active fund managers with good track records around us. And we'll, so it's not one or the other. I'd say it's a collaborative uh, trend in this country. But let's just look at the flows. If we can go to the next slide, just to see what's happened over the last decade or two. Firstly, it shows you over 10 years, 89% in the yellow there um, of US fund managers essentially close to 89, 90% have actually failed uh, to beat these global benchmarks. That's over 10 years. If you go over five years, we're happy to share these slides, uh, Eugene, with you and your colleagues uh, as well. The next slide is something similar. It shows you outside the US what happened in Europe and also in uh, Great Britain, where close to 90% of uh, the fund managers also they struggle over five years and 10 years to beat uh, the index. In a, in a given year, it could be lower, it could be only 70% that failed to beat the index. But generally, once you get out beyond three to five years, uh, these numbers seem to trend all roughly around 90% underperforming um, the, the MSCI world or the S&P 500 in particular. We'll just go to the next couple of slides, which shows you how much money is actually pouring out of active funds and into passive. So over the last decade and a half, we have not seen a negative outflow from passive uh, whereas active has had outflows almost every uh, single year. So I've got a couple of slides coming up just to show you the trend. Almost $6 trillion has gone into uh, passive. This is both ETFs and index funds. And the mega trend continues and active, unfortunately, continues to lose. I would say this is partly the level of transparency in the last decade that has really come to the fore. And there are many pension funds and others who are under pressure to... Um, essentially utilize indexing as a core building block, both for low cost and diversification reasons it's in their mandates, but it's also performance based. The next slide will show you just a, an example of what's happened more recently. In green, you see passive assets in the US have finally overtaken uh, active assets. So many of us who started off in the 70s or 80s, uh, it was all active fund managers, e even here in the US when I first worked on Wall Street back in 1990 uh, and also subsequently in the city of London it was primarily active, but you can see what's happened. The trend hey, basically gathered pace after the 2008-2009 crisis and more and more uh, fund managers, but also uh, I would say advisors and pension fund consultants increasingly realized they've got to um, basically use both building blocks, active and passive. And uh, that's where you see passive assets really overtaking now active. Just the last couple of slides, if you don't mind, we'll just go to the next one. It shows essentially every single year since 2009, in blue, you see the outflows of, of active here in the States, uh, and in red, the inflow into indexing and uh, specifically index funds and ETFs. There basically hasn't been one down year, I believe, since 2006, in fact, um, on the passive. So all we're saying really is, uh, it's very tough. It's like a needle in a haystack. There are some fantastic active managers out there. Some of them are our, our good friends. Uh, we're just saying folks should be utilizing more of a balanced approach with both uh, the MSCI uh, world as we do with BCI's global equity uh, brand denominated product. And there's a good way to balance both. So it shouldn't be one or the other. Uh, the last slide I believe is coming up or two. This just shows specifically globally the indexing is still catching up. It's a bit slower than in the US. The US trend has been ahead of this. Globally, um, in blue, indexing is about close to 40%, uh, give or take, of uh, assets now. Um, and, but the US continues to dominate. And that's why maybe Rich is bought into BlackRock. Uh, obviously, they're the largest ETF player out there. But um, they're of the largest five asset managers globally, interestingly, three out of the five, Eugene, are in fact passive firms, including our partners at State Street. And just lastly, to summarize, um, not only um, have about 70% of US funds, fund managers closed over the last 20 years, these are active funds, but the vast majority unfortunately struggled to beat uh, both the S&P 500 and the MSCI world. Um, we 
are quite optimistic this year that there's going to be a huge transition of money out of money market and, and even out of bonds into the equity market and that the Fed will be very accommodative with their policies and uh, the MSCI world remains not just low cost and a core approach, but incredibly diversified. I mean, you've got all the main sectors and all the, just to quickly summarize on the global front, the US is now 70% weighting, give or take, it's between 69 and 70. You've got Japan at about six, six and a half percent. You've also got um, Great Britain around 4%, France at three and Canada just over 3%. So it's incredibly global and they represent up to 90% of each of these countries uh, market caps. So I hope that just provides you a little bit of an overview. I'm happy to take any questions, but we're quite positive that the US economy is headed for a soft landing. Eugene, um, people are spending like crazy here. If you go to the shopping centers, if you uh, travel at any airports here, it's as busy as it's ever been. Restaurants are, are full. So the talk of a recession, I think, was uh, quite frankly, very premature. Uh, we don't get that sense over here. Anthony, thank you so much for sharing all those insights. Some very interesting slides. Uh, Thought-provoking, I thought. You know, we don't think about it that often. It's all that money sitting in U.S. cash. That was rates going down. That will inevitably go down. Uh, needs to find a home and more likely equity. So, yeah, very interesting that. Um, Anthony, a couple of questions from the audience. We're pretty much out of time. I'm going to take one question. Uh, and it speaks to your performance asset in December. You're slightly ahead of the MSCI benchmark. Uh, it also speaks to a question from the audience in terms of returns. So end of December, your fund 37, uh, 33.78, uh, the fund benchmark being the MSCI 33, so you're slightly ahead. Uh, question from our yes. audience, how, how is that? Why? It's done with taxes. Actually, the reason we work with State Street, Eugene, it's a great question, is uh, the MSCI world assumed the, the highest possible withholding tax rates for dividends when they flow uh, out. So obviously, this is an offshore fund. So they're assuming up to 30% withholding tax out of the US for dividends. Uh -huh. so if you work with State Street, you can get the tax rate down between 10 to 15%. So you can actually outperform the... Uh, <laughs> the index slightly based on having the greater use of tax treaties or double tax agreements. So that really uh, helps uh, offset um, some of the costs. So we don't actually suffer the highest uh, withholding tax rates that the MSCI is essentially assuming no tax treaty reductions. So they're assuming a 30% uh, dividend withholding tax out of the states, for example. That's a good question. That is, that is fascinating indeed. I didn't know that. Um, and to another question of the audience, uh, these numbers are net of fees. Uh, the fees of a fund, I'm talking about the feeder fund, uh, it's just short of 40 basis points. So you get good exposure, inexpensive, and then 40 bips is all in all. That's the total fees, no hidden costs, no nothing funny. Uh, Anthony, thank you so much for that. Very insightful. Some really good slides there. Uh, and another comment from our audience. Yes, we are going to share the slides and the recordings and everything. You're more than welcome to use this information with your clients. Anthony, thank you so much for joining us. And do I dare to say sweet dreams? I hope you catch a few <laughs> weeks before uh, the day uh, starts again. Thanks, Eugene, and talk seats to everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you so much for staying up so late. Right, that brings us to our next, next topic, global credit. Uh, and all the way from London here to share the views on global credit. They had a phenomenal run in 2023 is the one and only Paul Crawford. Paul, thank you so much for joining us again. It's always great to have you with us. Uh, like I said, you know, you had a phenomenal run in 2023. I think top of mind for a lot of clients, you know, what can they expect for 2024? Thank you so much. Excellent, Eugene. Thank you very much. And a good morning here from London, where it's it's a rather balmy 12 degrees this morning. So it's, it's simply summer-like here in London. So anyway, I'm going to obviously be talking about the BCI Fair Tree Global Income Plus feeder fund. Um, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about scoreboards, and I'm going to talk a little bit about all the storytelling that goes on within our market. And this should be, I think, not. There we go. Okay, so there's a disclaimer. Don't worry. Um, I won't be testing anyone towards the end on questions from this. It's just something you must have. So what am I going to talk about today? Well, in 20 minutes, 
I'm going to specifically speak about global credit, what it actually is, um, what our benchmark is. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is basically how it's done of late, uh, both in the short run and the long term. Third up, I'm going to talk about the fund and what it's currently doing. And then the last one at sort of conclusions, what, what, what should I, being you, be doing about it? So how should you be looking at this and sort of through what lens should you be appropriating capital to funds such as the, the Global Feeder Fund? So anyway, let's talk about what it is. Okay, so the BCI Global Income Plus Feeder Fund, it was launched in 2019. It's basically a feeder fund which allows RAND-based investors to, to access our Euro-denominated UCITS, which is obviously a European-styled unit trust, which is basically governed under the European legislation, which quite frankly forms a large part of what you actually see within BN90. Um, yeah, it's the important thing, it's a roll-up fund. So for South African investors, it's got rather rather good tax treatment. I just want to say that it's something that people gloss over often. I suggest you actually do some, some sort of uh, research into this, into how roll-up funds get preferential tax treatment, but it's certainly a good kicker for sort of post-tax returns. What you see is what you get. There's no sort of hidden taxes, which you'll see in any sort of other funds that pay dividends or other types of interest. Its benchmark is the iTrax crossover five-year total return index. I'm going to spend two slides on that. Um, that's a 75 equally weighted credit fund. Equally weighted, it's actually phenomenal. I hear a lot of people talking about diversification. Well, unfortunately for those that invest in sort of the top 40 index, the large cap index, you'll see that the majority of their risk is actually dominated by two or three large cap stocks in South Africa. So what you think is quite diversified is actually not really that diversified. And that's thanks to market capitalization. So you get this risk domination of extremely large cap stocks. Within, a, within an, an index which has equally weighted components, you end up getting the benefit of the central limit theorem, which is a statistical construct, which I spend a lot of time talking about generally, but not today. So you get that, that benefit of, of having non-domination when things start going wrong, which is very important from a credit perspective. This index is very well understood. It's exceptionally well traded here in Europe and the UK. It's representative, it's, it's fungible, it's this amazing sort of derivatives that spin off it. There's so much to do with this. It's, a, it's incredibly interesting and exciting. It's not like a like a boring old bond index, you know, that there's actually so much we can do with this. So it's an exciting index. Okay, 75 names make it up. This is a slide which shows you what's in there. Basically, if you actually have a look at these names, I'm not gonna go through them now, but there's a lot of names in there that you recognize. Air France, Rolls-Royce, Renault, uh, Vivendi, um, Volvo, uh, you know, have a look through it. Crown Holdings, you know, Iliad, You'll see a hot Jaguar Land Rover. You'll see a lot of names, Premier Foods. You'll see a lot of names in here that they're not, they're not names you haven't heard before. Remember what this is, 75 European sub-investment global credit names. This is what makes it up. Nokia, you see a whole lot of stuff you recognize. These are not companies, sort of backstreet, mom and pop businesses, which are operating out of someone's garage, for goodness sake. These are, these are large European companies. The benchmark trades as a spread to Euribor. So currently that spread right now is sitting, as you have a look at that slide, if you follow my pointer, it's trading right now at around about 325 basis points. So that's 325 basis points over Euribor. Um, and whatever Euribor is sitting at, currently sitting at roughly about 3.88%. Um, you actually add that spread to your eyeball and you get a, a prospective yield of that index. So 3.8 plus roughly about 3.25 gives you about 7.15% yield in euros. So that's what it's currently yielding round about right now. Remember that's in euros, converting that to rands. You just have the interest rate differential between South Africa and Europe, which currently sits at round about 3.4%. 4.4%, sorry, 4.4%. Um, 
percent, say three point four percent. So essentially, when you add those two together, you're getting an excess of sort of eleven eleven forty, you know, in rands. So it's pretty good yield over there right now. It's a credit fund, and as everyone is absolutely terrified of defaults, apparently, because credit is risky. Credit, you know, you these firms can default. Um, which they do from time to time, I may add. But essentially the fear of defaults is normally and has been and will always seem to be a lot more, how can I say, amplified than what has been delivered. Through mathematics, we can actually price how many, how many defaults were priced into our index, which is currently on series 40 and has been running for, for 20 years, by the way. How many defaults were priced in the inception of these of these these series? It, it reconstitutes and re-indexes every six months. So there's 20 years worth of this index. So there's 20, sorry, 40 different series over the last 20 years. So there's how many defaults were actually priced in at the beginning of each of these series. Remember, there's 75 names in each series, and this is what has been priced in. If we have a look to see what has actually been delivered, we get the next slide. These have the same scales. So you can see essentially that between the two of them, between that, that's what's been priced into the index with regard to defaults. And that was what was actually delivered. You can see there's a big difference to what's been priced in to what's been delivered. So the negativity to surrounding credit prevails not just in South Africa, I may add, but it also prevails, or prevails, sorry, in Europe as well. So if we look at them in absolute numbers, these are the total numbers of defaults that were in the five years of each of these series' life. So the red ones are still alive right now. And you can see essentially, sorry, I've just picked up again. I'm trying to move this thing over. That the ones that are alive, the series 31 to 40, have withstood very much less defaults than what was originally priced in. Obviously, at the end of the day, what you don't lose in defaults, you gain an excess performance to cash. That's the way you should look at this sort of thing. So series 31 to 40 have all outperformed the market's expectations with regard to defaults, which is, is quite a good place to be sets itself up pretty nicely for some series up. As you can see, series 40 right now, the new one, which was launched in September, has suffered no defaults so far. Series 39 has suffered one, series 38 one, and so it continues. That's the way you should look at these. Okay, so what has it done? What have, what have, these, what have these done? What have these indices done? Well, what I've got here is the total returns of the, in, of the different indices for 2023. Um, to Andrew's point just now, Anthony's point, sorry, um, we've seen total returns of the, of the North American indices absolutely dominating Europe and all other sort of regional areas in the world, the global indices. The Dow Jones did a whopping 16.2% last year in dollars. Going up a bit, the S&P 500, 26 and a quarter percent, roughly speaking, and the NASDAQ did an absolute reckon, great showing of 44.7% in US dollar terms in 2023. The DAX in euros did 20.3%. The FTSE, the sort of worst performer, that's here in the UK, our stock market, did roughly about 7.7%. .7. The aptly named CAC Courant did 20%. The SX5E, which is European Dow Jones large cap equivalent, did 23%. ITRAX crossover, i.e. the index which we use, that credit index did 17% last year. ITRAX crossover times two, the levered index, that 32%. ITRAX main, which is my definition of risk-free, and I'll show you why I say that, did only 6% in euros. To compare our top 40 index in South Africa to just shy of 9% in total return terms. The all bond index squeaked in a double digit return of 10.1. Cash did eight. And US Treasuries 
did a rather meager 4% during 2023. Not particularly good out of US Treasuries after all the hype about how well global bonds were going to do. If we look at long-term performance, obviously I've just showed you very short-term performance. We see, we see a quite a different sort of picture. So what I've got here is I've got those indices which I spoke about in the last slide and I've indexed them back to 100 in the second quarter of 2007. So if you'd invested 100 US dollars at the beginning of the second quarter of 2007, it would now be worth $743. You've more than seven times your money. If you'd invested 100 rand in the top 40 total return index, i.e. local equities, you would have had 475 rand. If you'd invested $100 in the S&P, 468. If you'd invested 100 euros in the ITRAX two times levered, you'd have 463. And that's the way you should read this chart. So it looks as if, you know, over the long term, you know, the risk has performed rather well. In fact, you can have a look and you can say, ah, this top 40 didn't do too badly, did it? It looks as if it's ranked second. I mean, if you have a look at this little, these numbers here, they're ranked from top to bottom. So the best performer in local currency was the NASDAQ. The worst performer in local currency, just delivering you 30.7% above your 100 you put in was iTrax. It's been the worst performer. If we put this in a risk return chart, you'll see a good sort of spread of risk and returns over that entire period. These are annualized risk numbers and annualized returns. If we look at a histogram of those quarterlies, you'll see this. You see a, a good spread of different shapes of histograms showing you a good spread of different risk as well as mean returns. Interestingly, the most peaky histogram is the ITRAX main. So the main index for ITRAX is 125 equally weighted European investment grade names, which delivers the most predictable returns, which makes it the least risky in its local currency. But South Africans don't invest in those offshore currencies, they invest in rents. So it's very important that South African investors don't just have a look at offshore return, they look at their RAND returns, which are obviously influenced by the currency in which that index is denominated in. So the NASDAQ in dollars, when translated back to RANDs, if you'd invested 100 RAND of the NASDAQ back in March 2007, you would currently have 2,284 RANDs today. That's assuming that you just sort of left it in the index and rebalanced the index every quarter. But that's what you would have. S&P 500, I hear a lot of people asking me, you know, should I invest in S&P or what index should I choose? Well, quite frankly, if you look at the difference in performance between the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones, largely irrelevant. Choose one of them. It doesn't really matter. How can I put it more established and more old stream rather than new stream type indices? So there are North American equities again dominating thanks to the performance of those indices and the strength of the US dollar. ITRAX crossover two times levered, funnily enough, comes in fourth position, which for your 100 rand would have generated 964 rands today. ITRAX crossover itself would have given you 493 rands outperforming local equities. Local equities over that period delivered you 475 rands. ITRAX crossover credit, the thing that everyone is terrified of the defaults, actually outperformed local equities since the second quarter of 2007. Now remember that goes through the global financial crisis it goes through the Greek default tragedy, tragedy, and it also goes through every sort of hiccup that we've seen along the way, including COVID. 
everyone has been subjected to the same issues. Next up is that US treasuries and RAND terms have produced almost precisely the same returns of equ as equities over the period from 2007 to the end of 2023. Very interesting. Um, yeah, ITRAC's main again and RAND's underperforming cash, our cash. Now that's a bit strange, you would think. But if you consider that our cash index is made up of literally sub-investment grade global names, you would expect an investment grade global index to actually produce less returns through time. That sort of makes sense. You're essentially taking less risk, paradoxically speaking. So there we are. Um, just to highlight the all bond index during that time, that's quite a long time. Last time I looked, that's from the second quarter of 2007. You were started with 100 rand and you would have basically four times your money. You would have ended up with 400 rand or just over three, just under, sorry, just under 300% total return over the entire period. That's quite interesting. When we actually have a look at risk return, we see a convergence of risk. This is to me is one of the most interesting slides that I'm going to show you today, a convergence of risk. So everything shifts in to where currency risk sits. So currency risk dominates the risk of the underlying indices, which I find quite fascinating in itself. In fact, if we have a look at what, the, what it does to histograms, it pulls histogram, it pulls them, how can I put it, elongates them. It, it pulls them from their peakiness and it flattens them. So we, we generate a lot more risk when we come through the currency. So when I compare these two sets of histograms, I see that the blue line remains the same because that's top 40, so it's in rands. But everything else actually flattens out, generating you more volatile returns, which is fascinating in my humble opinion. So let's just talk very briefly about the performance of how our thesis of investing in credit has done. Well, what I'm going to show you here is I'm not going to talk about the performance, but I'm going to talk about the rankings. This is the ranking table from Glacier's numbers that they produce on the Funds on Friday piece, which comes out every Friday. And this is from Friday the 2nd, i.e. the Friday just gone past. I'm not going to talk about performance. I'm going to talk about rankings. It's very important that I actually say that. So this is the BSI Income Plus Fund, and this is the Fairtree Flexible Income Plus Fund. The two are managed in exactly the same construct, exactly the same algorithms that work out how we actually are appropriate new instruments, and they're exactly the same mandates. So you can see that over one year, we have ranked first and second out of 132 different fund manager, different funds, should I say, in that multi-asset income category. Two years ranked one and three, three years ranked two and nine, all the way out to 10 years, where we only have 10 years for the flexible income plus, it's ranked first. By the way, BCI Income Plus will hit its 10 year, um, well, 10 year anniversary next month, and it will see a 10 year ranking, which will be number one. And then Flex will go to number two. So that will be one and two out of 48 over a 10 year period, which is quite a long time. If you look at the Global Flexible Income Plus, I'm not going to talk about the factor it produced over 20% over the past year. But at the end of the day, it's ranked first in a very small peer group. Don't even talk about it. It doesn't even really matter. It's such a small peer group. But anyway, essentially what I'm actually saying is our thesis of how we manage funds is not even up for debate anymore. It works consistently. So um, I'm not going to project massive changes to the way we actually run these mandates. So you can expect literally more of the same when it comes to performance over the next period as well. So what do we do? Well, remember this feeder fund invests directly in the USITS fund. So it's, it's actually pointless talking about the feeder fund because all the feeder fund is, is a vehicle for RAND based investors to actually invest in our global USITS fund. So I'm gonna spend the next few minutes talking about the USITS fund itself. The USITS fund right now is roughly about 68 and a half million euros. That's to Friday the 19th of January. It's got high levels of liquidity, 
talking about, sorry, 18% liquidity is a highly liquid fund. We have, this is our, uh, the way we actually measure risk within the fund. We talk about single sudden default exposure. The two biggest exposures are to cash deposits that we have at Northern Trust, as well as margin accounts at SOCGEN, which have our largest exposures. The next largest exposure we have is to Deutsche Bank, which is roughly 3 million euros of the 68 million um, fund, which sits about roughly 4.5% of the fund. That's our next biggest exposure. And that exposure is made up of instruments which are that revolve from ITRAC sub-investment grade, uh, sorry, sub-financial indices, as well as tranches of the main index. Um, so we, we actually drill down into the indices and into the tranches that we own to check where our exposures actually come from. And then obviously we have another actual vanilla corporate bond issued by Deutsche Bank that we have exposure to. So what should we do about it? Right, so this little slide is all about why people invest, right? And it's, it's why do people invest? Do they invest to put nuts away for the winter, for the future? Do they invest because they've got too much income? Do they invest because they want to have a go or swing the bat or, or have a nice talk at Bryce about the latest two stock picks? I find a lot of people talk about stock picks. One or two uh, instruments that they have. Goodness gracious, you know. Our fund has got hundreds of exposures. It's impossible for me to talk about the potential of stock picks. You know, it's like if a fund has got one dominating exposure, you should actually be almost scared rather than find comfort in someone telling you about how this one stock has done so well. And goodness gracious, what are they selling you? You know, it's like, as I said yesterday, if I find gold here in Royal Hospital Road where I live, would I tell anyone? Absolutely not. Because as soon as I tell anyone else, they come prospecting there and trying to steal, take the gold which I've found. I wouldn't tell anyone where I'd found gold, would I? Anyway, so why are you doing it? I would argue that every time you, you invest, you invest to increase returns or reduce your portfolio risk. That's why you're doing it. Um, there's no quick fix. And there's lots of under delivery out there. And the last presenter actually spoke quite, for quite a long time about how many fund managers outperform the indices. It's absolutely frightening. It's, 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 it's terrifying, actually. And they sell you this, this, we will do, we will do. And then, of course, they don't deliver. Um, yeah, which is scary. What the future holds? Well, let me tell you this, Sam. Nobody knows. One cut, two cuts, three cuts, 10 cuts, 100 cuts, no one knows. The future is going to be different. Right? That's what I can tell you. What happens tomorrow is probably nothing like what you envisaged today. The next thing I want to say is when you should invest, you find assets and fund managers with tried and trusted track records. That's the only thing. That's the, the only thing you can really assume is that people will continue to do what they've been doing. A leopard doesn't really change his spots, does he? If he's got a a history of swinging the bat and having a go, oh, you should be scared. Um, arguably, the reason that so many fund managers fail through time is that eventually they get found out that they were actually more lucky than anything else. Interesting. I'm going to finish off now with two more slides, and that's going to be it for the day. What I'm going to show you here is essentially the long-term returns of NRANDs of the different indices in return and risk terms. This is in RANDs. So I've got the Dow in RANDs, it's return and risk in RANDs, NASDAQ, FTSE, S um, SX5E, that's large cap Europe, ITRAX crossover, the credit index, ITRAX levered, which is my favorite index, ITRAX main, and then top 40 in Albi. So there's everything shown you in RANDs from the second quarter of 2007 to the fourth quarter of 2023. This is all inclusive of reinvested dividends, reinvested coupons of the Albi, reinvested coupons of the US Treasuries. That's what it is. Sorry, yeah, sorry, that, that's in, my apologies, that's in, that's in local currency. 
My apologies there. When I change it to ZAR, this is the one I wanted to show you. This is what it spits back. Okay, so the Dow in RANS has produced 15.8% per year since 2007. And it's produced at a 14% risk, as described as an annual annualized quarterly standard deviation of return. The US Treasuries on the right-hand side has produced 9.28% returns in RANS at 18% risk. Now, everyone in the room is quite comfortable with top 40 returns and risk. They feel comfortable with that one, you know. Mostly if people have about 70% of their, between 60 and 70% of their investments are in local equities. So they must feel comfortable with that sort of risk and return characteristic. So now I've referenced everything to the top 40. Oh, by the way, these are all continuously compounded. So I can actually do a simple subtraction or addition to get to the numbers. And this is relative return to the top 40 and relative risk relative to the top 40. So the Dow Jones comes out, given you since 2007, it gave you 6.5% excess return to the top 40 at lower risk. The NASDAQ has given you 9.4%, roughly speaking, return every year to the top 40 with only a marginal increase in risk. The FTSE has underperformed at lower risk though. SX5A only underperforming by 0.65% per year at higher risk. ITRAX crossover has produced extra return at much lower risk. ITRAX crossover times two, 4.22% extra return each year at marginally higher risk. If we turn to the right, we get to the Albay, underperformed top 40 by roughly 1.1% per year at substantially lower risk. And then the interesting one is US Treasuries. The US Treasuries have produced South African equity return at extra risk to the top 40. Now, what I'm not talking about is the correlation of those indices through time. People could point to the fact to tell me that they are uncorrelated. But if you were Rip Van Winkle and you put your 100 rand into the top 40, and 100 rand into US treasuries, you chose one or the other, over that entire period, you'd have basically the same returns. But the US treasuries would have given you more risk in rands. And this is what people tend to forget. Don't think US treasuries, US treasuries in dollars are not very volatile. But US treasuries in rands are more volatile than the top 40. They're more volatile than local equities. So to conclude my very last slide, 2023, as Eugene pointed out, was a fantastic year for risk assets and a fantastic year for our credit funds. The long-term credit performance numbers of US equities have swamped, and this is going back to the previous presenter who spoke about this, US equities have absolutely swamped all the other indices, not just in their own currencies, but more importantly in RANDs. The case is, the question should be asked, why were we not more invested in US equities back in 2007? Certainly in 2023, with the NASDAQ producing 44.7% in US dollars. Crazy stuff, isn't it? Next thing I wanna say is that risk converges to FX risk. Histograms flatten. That's what happens. That's not me just uh, dreaming this up. This is what the numbers show us, not predicting anything. This is what the numbers are saying. The performance numbers of credit funds are attractive across all tenors. If anyone wants to talk to me afterwards about how we've done relative to cash, relative to the old bond index, relative to anything, please give me a shout, drop me a line, I'll show you. There's nothing hidden in what we do. Relative risk and reward has proven in favor of US equities and European credit. European credit has outperformed European equities over the long run. This is the paradox of the whole thing. Credit cannot be ignored. Credit should form one of the cornerstone of everybody's portfolios. It's something which has been not looked upon for too long. Now. And then the final point, and this is the most pertinent point, risk-free treasuries and so on have delivered more volatility than local equities. 
And that to me is a very interesting point. And thank you for listening to me. Oh, thank you so much for that. I think your last two points summed it up exactly. Uh, you can't ignore credit uh, and for our audience, BCI Fairtree Global Income Plus Fund on most of the platforms. That's the feeder fund. They have the international usage version, obviously, as well, as Paul mentioned. Paul, thank you for the great work you and your team are doing and keep on doing it. Like I said to you, the only thing you know is the fund managers you can trust. So thank you for that. Really appreciate it. We'll chat you in the near future. Paul, one last point. Sorry, there is a question from the audience uh, from Martin. It's actually a, a stack of questions. We will get those questions through to you as well. If you can maybe reply to that, we'll get it. Uh, Martin, we'll get those answers back to you as well. Paul, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eugene. Our next session proved to be interesting global growth in emerging markets from Sands Capital. Uh, at Sands Capital are based in Arlington. It made the connection a little bit difficult. We had problems last time, like Washington, D.C. Time difference is also a bit bothersome. So it is recording uh, from the Executive Managing Director, Brian Christensen, uh, to share the views on long-term growth investing and how it comes together in the Sands Capital Funds. Uh, Ian Barnes, I must mention, is on the line. That is uh, the distribution specialist. Uh, from London. So, Ian, thank you for joining us as well. Uh, if you do have questions afterwards, we can get that through to uh, Ian or to Brian. Uh, more than happy to do that. Olga, if you're ready, we're ready. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Brian Christensen, and I'm a co-portfolio manager on both our global growth and our emerging markets growth strategies at Sands Capital. I'm here to address uh, the topic of emerging markets public equities, which has been a very challenging asset class when compared to developed markets over the last uh, decade. And why we think when we look out to the future, uh, the horizon looks much brighter uh, than the experience that the asset class had over the previous decade. So first, for a little bit of context about the challenging uh, backdrop uh, related to emerging markets equities over the last few decades. Most investors look to include emerging markets within their portfolios, or I should say allocators look to uh, add emerging markets because emerging markets are a large addressable asset class. It's home to more than half the world's population. And it's typically tied to economies that are on average tend to be growing much faster in developed markets. And the hope is that the asset class would be able to add diversification uh, to a broader balanced portfolio. However, if you're measuring the asset class performance uh, by the MSCI EM benchmark, uh, the results uh, have been uh, quite mixed, uh, to say the best. On the uh, top illustration, what we have is uh, the MSCI Emerging Markets Index in dark blue versus the MSCI World Index, which represents developed markets, equity returns over the last uh, 30 years. And from that perspective, from that very long-term time horizon, you can see that um, MSCI EM has outperformed the developed markets. But if you zoom in on the bottom uh, slide, you can see, or the bottom illustration, you can see that the EM uh, uh, index is significantly underperformed the MSCI, MSCI World Index over the last five years. And it's also underperformed over the last uh, decade. Although I'm zooming in on the five years because um, that has been a significant contributor to that underperformance, even over that uh, longer term time frame. Uh, to put a little bit of color around that, over the last five years, the MSCI World uh, Index returned uh, about 13.7% per year uh, for the last five years versus only 3.8% uh, uh, per year for the last five years. For a delta of almost 10% as measured by the EM index, um, hasn't delivered uh, the type of diversification, at least to the same extent, that many emerging uh, markets allocators uh, have been hoping for. So the question is, what happened over the last five years that drove that significant dispersion, that nearly 10 percentage point dispersion in returns versus MSCI EM index and the MSCI world? And I would um, really put it on three primary things. And then there's also a quick fourth topic that I can mention. The, uh, the three primary contributors to that dispersion are China, Russia, 
and uh, currency slash U.S. dollar strength. By far, the biggest driver uh, has been uh, China, which is responsible for uh, 6% uh, annualized uh, return dispersion. So 6 of that 10% on average has been uh, due to uh, the significant pullback in uh, Chinese equities over the last five years. Uh, another roughly two percentage points by our calculations has been driven by the headwinds from a strong uh, U.S. dollar. And about a percentage point has been uh, driven by uh, poor performance uh, in Russia within the MSCI EM index and the ultimate exclusion of Russia within that index. <clears throat> now, from our perspective, those are three significant headwinds that we think are unlikely uh, to have the same uh, impact when we look uh, over the next five to 10 years as the impact over the previous uh, five plus years. <clears throat> the other quick thing that I'd mention is when we talk about developed market returns, the market has been very uh, narrow, in fact, where uh, the U.S. has been the predominant driver of the developed market uh, or the MSCI World Index. And even within the U.S., there's been a lot of concentration uh, within returns of uh, big, big tech um, and the Magnificent Seven, uh, uh, so to speak. So, you know, is the EM asset class uh, broken? And we would assert it is not broken. And one of the reasons uh, is because, you know, as an investor, we view our opportunity set for investing in emerging markets uh, a little bit different than the allocator perspective, particularly in terms of how we define um, our opportunity set. Uh, here on the left-hand side, what you see is that the MSCI EM index has a little bit less than 1,300 constituents in it. And again, whenever most investors are describing asset class returns, this is really the benchmark that, that most folks are, are referring to. However, uh, we think our, uh, our, our opportunity set for developing market uh, businesses is about two to three times that for a variety of different reasons. One is the index um, uh, doesn't always include some smaller, but we, what we think are still uh, investable uh, uh, businesses. So that you know, nearly doubles the opportunity set. In addition, uh, what we view as our opportunity set from a geographic perspective is developing economies um, that are excluded from the developed market index, which also includes a frontier market uh, uh, geographies, for example. So uh, in our emerging markets portfolio, uh, just as an example, we, you know, we own a business called Caspi, which is one of the leading online digital banking platforms as well as uh, e-commerce platforms uh, in Kazakhstan, which is a frontier market business as classified by MSCI, which isn't in the MSCI EM uh, uh, benchmark. Um, there's also a category of businesses where the, the businesses in terms of the revenue generation and profit generation uh, have the strong majority of revenues being generated in within emerging markets businesses, but because of quirks and how the MSCI classifies um, a developed versus emerging markets business, it isn't included in the EM index. And that also adds a couple hundred uh, additional uh, businesses. So example of that in our portfolio is AIA, which is the leading life insurance company across uh, emerging Asia. The majority of revenues are being generated by mainland and Chinese citizens who are buying uh, life insurance policies either in Hong Kong uh, or in mainland China. However, because it's technically classified as a Hong Kong business and MSCI um, classifies Hong Kong as a developed market country, it's not including in the index. So again, when you add all of those uh, differences together, we view our opportunity set as two to three times larger. And about a third of our portfolio since inception of 2013 within the emerging markets um, has been in off benchmark emerging markets businesses. And that's been a significant alpha generator uh, for our portfolio uh, over that uh, time frame. Putting the much broader opportunity set aside for a moment, the other thing that's made EM a very fertile ground for uh, active investors like ourselves is the fact that there's significant return dispersion uh, from both individual companies as well as geographies. Uh, so if you can get your fair share of the left tail of uh, strong performing businesses, for example, over the last decade, uh, while also avoiding your fair share of the big detractors, um, that can help drive significant uh, value creation in the portfolio. And the same is true from a country perspective. So for example, I talked about um, China being a significant drag on the uh, benchmark uh, over the last five years. Conversely, what's happening in China looks very different than what's happening in India, for example, 
uh, which has been a significant driver of returns, has performed much better uh, than China. And that's actually where we've had a long-term uh, large relative overweight versus the benchmark, uh, as well as India has been our single largest absolute weight um, for, for over a decade uh, now. And what we illustrate here is that larger opportunity set, that fertile ground for stock selection and being selective in terms of uh, geographies, industries, and companies has meant that the MSCI EM index has it ranked above better than the 64th percentile on a 10, 5, 3, or 1 year uh, a basis. So from our perspective, given that backdrop, where are the forward-looking opportunities with EM and where do we see a, um, promising wealth creation opportunities uh, to drive both attractive absolute and relative uh, results in the asset class? Very quickly, um, you know, some of the types of areas where we found opportunities is as a, a, a global investment research organization, we spend a lot of time trying to understand which particular industry and geography may there be a global multinational leader uh, who's poised to be the winner and where may there be an actual sort of local uh, winner and why. So a great example of that uh, is a business um, that we own at Sands called Dino Polska. It's a leading uh, food retailer in Poland. Uh, it's really put together uh, the best of several different formats, all in uh, one single format for Dino. So it's put together the, the, the uh, deep value and attractive pricing of a hard discounter with the convenience in terms of store locations uh, of a convenience store, and then the fresh meat and produce uh, section that you typically see in a supermarket, all in one format catered towards the uh, suburban and rural uh, consumer in Poland. Uh, and that's led Dino to be a significant market share gainer, uh, where uh, many of the multinational players um, operating uh, in Poland have, have struggled to compete. Another attractive part about the emerging markets is in many of them, uh, some of the penetration rates in attractive business models can be very, very early. Uh, a great example there of a business that we own at Sands is called Apollo Hospitals. Apollo uh, is uh, the largest for-profit hospital operator in India. It's also the largest um, publicly traded retail pharmacy operator uh, in India. And finally, it's building out a what we believe is a very attractive uh, digital health ecosystem all under one uh, umbrella in one business. Um, and one of the most attractive things about uh, the Indian uh, healthcare industry for a company like Apollo is India has one of the lowest ratios of uh, hospital beds per capita, not just relative to other uh, developing uh, or developed economies, but also versus other emerging markets economies, which gives them a very long runway uh, for growth and helps them actually be an, an enabler and a large investor in building out the healthcare infrastructure in India. And then finally, another area uh, or type of uh, business that we've uh, been identifying within the emerging markets is what we call local businesses that are going either regional or even global. And a great example there is uh, WAG, which is a Brazilian business. It is, a, um, it is the leader, market share leader, with well over 50% market share in uh, industrial electric motors. There's a big shift towards the electrification of industrial motors, which WAG uh, benefits from, and then towards uh, industrial motors with a lower total cost of ownership. A more uh, efficiency from an electric uh, use perspective, um, and then more adaptability and flexibility to the various different uh, use cases of their customers. And they've also been expanding globally. Uh, they are one of the largest players uh, globally, uh, not just in Brazil, uh, with infrastructure in Mexico and India uh, and emerging Asia as well. So we talked about what we believe is an expanded opportunity set, a uh, confluence of headwinds that we think won't be headwinds to the same extent going forward. And then also uh, how we find uh, uh, some opportunities uh, or the types of business models where we've seen opportunities. So the final question is, you know, beyond why EM, why EM now? And my short answer to that is where we often uh, are able to see an acceleration of investment opportunities is when there's accelerating underlying change in global economies, including the emerging markets. And we're at a period where we are seeing that. And when there's an intersection of change and innovation, there's typically a business that's either driving that change through innovation or is at a choke point to benefit from that change. And that's what creates a lot of what we believe is long duration sector growth opportunities where you can find that five to 10 plus year uh, a business and stock winner. 
Um, and some of the biggest areas of change, which we think are fertile grounds for opportunity, which are either you know, meaningful exposures in the portfolio today or areas where we're looking to add exposure over time. That includes you know, AI, machine learning, and digital transformation. Uh, you know, companies like uh, TSMC being the largest enabler from a semiconductor fab perspective, or uh, Globant, uh, for example, uh, which is helping enable digital transformation, um, the electrification and that you know broader supply chain across not just industrial motors but uh, uh, commercial vehicles and the future of energy, financial services penetration. The majority of the world's unbanked or underbanked uh, resides in emerging markets, and there's companies like Bajaj Finance or HDFC uh, Bank in India which are incumbent banks uh, who are ultimately harnessing technology uh, to attract new customers and expand their uh, financial services portfolios and their banking portfolios for those customers. There's companies like New Bank, which are fintech challengers to legacy banks in Brazil and broader Latin America. You know, India itself um, has a lot of opportunities in our view across a number of different uh, industries. Um, India is sort of flying up the leaderboard, uh, as you can see on the left, in terms of you know being a large, attractive uh, economy. And you know, I would challenge anyone um, to to put a higher probability in any large country around the world that has a shot at growing GDP five to six percent in real terms uh, per year for the next five to ten years, other than in, other than India. So other things like retail formalization, or also we're seeing the rejiggering of supply chains and nearshoring in in Mexico, for example. So. There's, and, and these aren't even all the changes uh, uh, that we're seeing. This is just a subset of them. So where change happens, there's typically significant opportunity and we're seeing accelerated change. And we're very excited about not only the portfolio, but how the opportunity set is evolving uh, with the type of uh, uh, leading innovative growth businesses that uh, tend to meet uh, our six criteria. So putting all this together, um, our mission is to enhance the wealth of our clients with prudence over time, the way we measure our ability to do that is, uh, or our success in doing that, is our rolling relative results versus the benchmark. We also obviously want attractive uh, absolute results, but from a re relative results perspective, you can say, you can see that we've uh, outperformed on a strong majority of rolling three-year periods and all of the rolling five, seven, and 10-year periods since inception of 2013. Um, and uh, from an absolute uh, perspective and relative uh, perspective, you can also see uh, those results uh, since inception and uh, since inception we've been able to outperform on a net basis of roughly 300 basis points so thank you for your uh, time today um, and as you can see i'm very excited about the emerging markets opportunity set going forward despite what has been a very challenging uh, asset class uh, uh, performance over the last five and ten years but as active investors and leading innovative growth businesses within the emerging markets uh, we're not investing in the asset class we're investing in a, what we believe is a high quality a group of businesses that meet our Sands Capital Six criteria that can compound earnings at above average rates and ultimately drive, um, uh, uh, if we do our, our job correctly, uh, we expect to ultimately drive very attractive relative and absolute results when looking out over the next five plus years. Yep. Thank you, Olga, for that. And uh, Ian, thank you for answering that question that was online. Uh, I see there's another question online. We unfortunately don't have time to take it right now. Uh, Ian, if you would be so kind to look at that as well, really appreciate it to our audience. If you want to know more about the Sands Capital Funds or any questions on that, we're more than happy to get you in touch with Ian Barnes, like I mentioned, is on the line as well. Our last session for the day, but definitely not the last, uh, speaking to Global Value, all the way from Jersey, who better to do this than Simon Robert Homer. Uh, Simon, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Contrarius Asset Management, uh, the company where you find uh, opportunities with solid earnings that you don't overpay for. Um, maybe just for our audience, Simon, before you start, uh, you run two strategies. We've got the feeder funds for those two strategies as well, Global Equity, Global Balanced. Uh, so very concentrated, very focused, uh, no room for any other distractions when looking at the two funds. Simon, thank you so much for being with us this morning. I really appreciate it. Brilliant. Thank you, Eugene. Can you hear me? Perfectly fine. Thank you. Perfect. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, it's absolutely uh, fantastic to be here. Um, I've only got 15 minutes, so let me jump straight into it. Olga, if we can maybe go to, we can skip through all the disclaimers. Uh, if we can hop to our first slide, which oh. is our Top all the important holdings. stuff, yeah? 
there we go. Um, so this slide shows our top 10 shares. Um, they generally account for between sort of 52 to 57% or so of our portfolio of our fund, so, so just over half. And um, as you can see, it's a very eclectic mix of, of companies. I think you would probably struggle to find another manager in the world with an even remotely similar portfolio to, to this one. Our two largest shares are what I would call um, sort of deep value opportunities. Um, those are businesses, so Paramount and Warner Brothers, media entertainment businesses. Um, those are businesses that are in transition as the world moves from linear to, to streaming. Um, they're incurring very high costs at the moment, running sort of several platforms at once. Um, and the growth on the streaming side is at the moment not yet sufficient to offset the very slow decline on the linear side. But at some point that should um, inflect. And as soon as the market starts realizing that, um, we think these shares can, can re-rate quite strongly. Um, they're trading on our estimate of between sort of three and five times um, normalized earnings. So we think those are sort of classic value opportunities. Um, unlike the next three shares, maybe Tesla, Amazon, Meta, um, those have probably been the most difficult businesses for us to own over the over the recent over the recent few uh, sort of quarters. Um, why do I say that? Well, they are very large in the index. As you can see, they are three large shares in the MSCI growth index too, um, which makes it difficult for a contrarian manager to, to, to buy. Um, they're very polarizing. Uh, classic, I would say, value investors absolutely despise them. Tesla in particular is, is actually very heavily shorted and I think is quite a misunderstood company. Uh, of all the shares we own, we get by far the most questions on, on these three companies. They've been grouped into the sort of magnificent seven, but I think they're actually very different businesses. And in fact, their performances have been incredibly divergent. Uh, you Don't forget that a company like Tesla, for example, is down probably 60% from its peak. Um, it's actually had a tough few years. Um, and now it's, I mean, it's less than half the size of, of the smallest of the other magnificent six call it companies. It's less than half the size of, of Meta. Um, if we go down that list, you'll also see Alibaba in our top 10. Now we've spent a lot of time, um, especially over the last few months, looking at Chinese shares in, in great detail. As you all know, the Chinese market's been incredibly weak um, and there are some really good companies in, in China. You'll see Alibaba in our top 10. And in fact, if you take at our end of January fact sheet, um, you'll see that Baidu has also crept into our top 10. Um, maybe, Olga, if I can move on to the next slide. Um, this just touches on, on Amazon in a little bit more detail. And what this chart here shows is the e-commerce penetration um, as a percentage of total US retail sales. And you can see that it's been slowly growing over the, over the years as people become more and more accustomed to shopping online. But then interestingly, you can see during COVID, in one quarter, the e-commerce pen penetration in America um, went up by as much as it would have gone up in the previous sort of four to five years. Um, and that's of course, because we were all locked into our houses and, and we couldn't leave. Um, now, I mean, it's unsurprising that post that spike that you saw early in COVID, once the world started reopening, people went sort of back to their old shopping habits. But actually, um, um, it sort of um, resulted in a sort of a, a higher base. So the numbers fell back, but not back to where they were today. In fact, they fell back to a, a level that was a penetration rate that's quite a lot higher than what the penetration rate was pre-COVID. So it seemed that there was almost a structural shift in the spending patterns of consumers and Amazon has definitely benefited. Um, note that Amazon's market share as a percentage of total e-commerce retail in, in the US is about 38%. Amazon is by a long way the market leader. The next biggest um, participant in the market would be a company like Walmart, which only has uh, last I looked around a six and a half percent or so market share versus Amazon's 38. So it's a wonderful business that we think has grown structurally from, um, from, from you know, a change in, in, in consumption patterns in the US. 
It's got an incredibly wide moat. Um, also during COVID, what Amazon did is they basically doubled their fulfillment capacity in, in the US. So they spent a ton of CapEx and, and OpEx um, to make the business even better long-term. This is a management team that's never shied away from making uh, difficult short-term decisions um, that will put the business in, 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 in a better state longer term. Earnings and cash flows are extremely understated. So don't be deceived by a high um, PE ratio. I think the true earnings capability of a business like Amazon is, um, is, is immense. And over time, um, we think they will grow into their new fulfillment capacity without having to incur too many additional, um, too many additional costs. In addition to this, they're also growing their um, third party fulfillment business, as well as their advertising business on the back of their own um, sort of higher, higher e-commerce e sales. And those are both high margin, highly cash generative and, and high quality um, streams of, of business. If we look at the next slide, that's the fourth leg of, of Amazon's businesses. And this is Amazon Web Services. Amazon basically invented the public cloud. We were initially um, concerned about um, pricing on the public cloud and the sustainability thereof, but um, recent advances in artificial intelligence in sort of how large language models work have caused us to reassess our, our previous um, sort of beliefs and our previous thesis. Um, and actually we think the business is a lot more sustainable now and has a lot more growth than we previously would have thought. Um, you need to remember that AI is incredibly data intensive. It's almost impossible for all but the literally largest few businesses in the world um, to do it themselves. The computing power, the chips, the storage requirements are just immense. And the scale would require astronomical investments in physical infrastructure, um, which to us, basically means that most companies are going to do whatever they need to do in, in, the, in the cloud. Um, so AI will actually become a key driver of cloud adoption going forward. And you saw that last week when Microsoft reported, I think their cloud business grew by 30% year on year. And they noted that artificial intelligence now makes up a full six percentage points of that 30% of growth, whereas in the previous quarter, it only made up 3% um, of, of the rate of growth. So it's actually early days and growing off quite a low base, but it's already one fifth of the growth um, and, 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 and growing. And as you can see on this chart, um, at the moment, sort of where we are in 2023, 2024, just over 10% of all the IT spending happens in the cloud, which means that 90% still happens on premise. So we think there is, um, there is a lot of room to, to grow. Um, if we look at the next slide and we just compare um, sort of what people call the magnificent seven or, or, or whatever you want to call it. So the, the largest cap um, companies in, in the US, Apple, Microsoft, um, as you can see on the, on the left hand chart there, their market caps are sort of three, three odd um, trillion dollars for Apple uh, as well as for Microsoft. I think Microsoft has now overtaken Apple as, as the largest company in the world. Well, um, if we compare their market capitalizations um, to those of Amazon, Meta, and Tesla, um, you'll see there that Amazon, Meta, Tesla has more or less the same market cap as, um, as, as Apple or Microsoft. So that's if we add Amazon plus Meta plus Tesla. If we look at the, the amount of free cash flow that these companies generated in 2024, those are the middle bar charts there, um, you'll see that um, Apple plus um, oh, sorry, Amazon plus Meta plus Tesla generated a little bit more cash flow than, than Apple did, but in fact, quite a lot more cash than, than Microsoft did. And then what we did on the right-hand bar charts there is we just took the Bloomberg consensus forecast. So these are not our numbers. Um, this is to be pretty sort of, you know, unemotional and objective about this and say, let's see what the average um, analyst out there believes. Um, so that's captured in the table there. They believe Apple will grow its free cash by 9.8% per annum between 2024 and 2027. The Microsoft is believed to grow its free cash flow by around 19% per annum. And Apple, Meta, Tesla are believed to grow a little bit faster, 22% per annum. And then what we've done is we've said, 
on those numbers, assuming the consensus is correct, which is of course a very big assumption, um, what is our implied exit multiple on free cash flow in 2027, which is three years out? And you can see for Apple, you get to a multiple of 21, for Microsoft, a multiple of 25, and for Amazon Meta and Tesla, on average there, you get an exit multiple of, of 15.5 times. Now, um, the, the first thing I'd note is that that's obviously a lot lower than the exit multiple for an Apple or a Microsoft. Um, the second thing I would say is that we think beyond 2027, Amazon, Meta, and Tesla will grow a lot faster and continue growing a lot faster than Apple or Microsoft. And in addition, I would note that on our numbers, um, our, consent, uh, our, our growth in free cash flow forecast to 2027 are well in excess of, of what the, the market is expecting. So on our numbers, um, the disparity in valuations in 2027 is, is even more extreme. So we think even amongst those large few companies, there is still quite a lot of um, opportunity to, to, add relative, to add relative value. Um, if, we, if we hop onto the next slide, um, this, this is another very fertile, I would say, opportunity at, at the moment where we are finding a lot of interesting value. Um, and those are companies that were very popular and grew rapidly during COVID, but where sentiment has swung from one extreme to, to, to another extreme. Um, and in fact, those shares that were very popular then are now practically left for dead. Um, Zoom video communications, um, Snap and Twilio are, are just three such, such examples. Now, Z Zoom, we all know, that's the video communications company. Snap is one of the largest social media companies in the world. They've got um, more than 750 million active monthly users and, and well over 400 million active daily users. Um, and Twilio is, um, is a market leader in, um, in, in customer communications and customer engagement. Basically what Twilio does is they help companies to better understand their customers and to raise the quality of, of, of engagement. Now we own some others too that look like this. One example would be DocuSign that's just outside of our top 10. And what this chart does here is it bases their share prices um, as of April, 2019, we base their share price to 100. So this is Zoom, Snap, and Twilio, um, equal weighted, so a third, a third, a third, base to 100 in 2019. Why 2019? Well, that's when Zoom listed. So you can see since Zoom listed, on average, the share prices went up about four and a half fold going into COVID, and then they collapsed. I mean, then they fell by 80 plus percent on average, and they are currently at a level of below 100, which is below where they were even pre the pandemic. Um, this is despite the fact that the pandemic was actually decidedly positive for these businesses. If you look at the next slide, um, the next slide shows their revenue growth over the same period. And again, if I base their revenues to 100 pre pandemic, look at how their revenues grew through the pandemic, sort of fourfold, from 100 to 400. Uh, by 2023. Um, in 2023, their revenue was flat on sort of 2022, so no decline. And in fact, again, if I look at Bloomberg consensus numbers for next year, um, you're seeing revenue growth. So actually, it seems to us that the gains that these companies um, sort of experienced through COVID have actually remained. Um, and next year, revenues are continuing to grow off what is now a far higher base. So despite the fact that you just contrast that revenue growth number, despite the fact that revenues now are up four and a half fold on where they were pre the pandemic, the share prices are below where they were pre the pandemic, when revenues were less than 20% of what revenues are today. In addition, a lot of these companies are starting to buy back shares they're starting to generate tremendous amounts of free cash flow. They have strong balance sheets by and large. Um, and they're also starting to right size their cost bases, driving efficiencies, um, et cetera. So we think they are better businesses than they were pre the pandemic. They are far bigger businesses than, they, than what they were pre the pandemic. A lot of the pandemic benefits have in fact stuck. 
the fundamentals have vastly improved. And despite that, you're paying prices for these shares that are lower than they were um, in 2019. So that's a sort of a typical anatomy of, of where we are finding value. I'm just short on 15 minutes, maybe just quickly on Zoom, the next slide. Um, and that just shows what, what I spoke about. This is the number of enterprise customers at Zoom. So not retail customers, but these are businesses that are actually paying a subscription of more than $100,000 each at, at year end. And you can see how those numbers have grown, not only through the pandemic, but even post the pandemic, those numbers are, are continuing to grow. The Q3 number for 2024 is, is only for nine months. The previous numbers are all for 12 months. And then maybe my final slide, um, is a, is a similar slide to this one, and that's just for Snap, which is a social media company. Um, and you can see there how Snap's user base has grown across all their divisions. So both in North America, which are obviously their, their more valuable clients, average revenues per user are, are higher in North America than elsewhere in the world. But look at how they've grown in Europe and, and in the rest of the world. And it doesn't seem to us that, that these numbers are slowing down in, in any meaningful way. So. We continue to be optimistic about these type of opportunities that, that we are seeing. Um, and um, let me maybe end it at that. I think it's 15 minutes on the dot. I'm happy to take, um, to take a few questions. Simon, you're always spot on with your time. Uh, never doubt that any time ever. Um, just very quickly, the feeder funds are fairly new, but uh, the contrarian uh, contrarious funds Mm -hmm. uh, the heuristic based funds has been going for a very long time with a very good track record. Let's just talk about performance very quickly. It speaks to one of the questions from the audience, uh, from Sean as well. Uh, up until December 2023, really strong performance numbers. Uh, your one month number for December, strong. Your 12 month number, very strong. Uh, but year to date, so for 2020, 2024, uh, proved to be a bit more challenging, especially yeah. if I look at uh, the rest of the peer group, global equity, general funds. Yeah. Why is that? Why the big difference? Yeah. So we had a we had a tough January this year, and um, we had a very good January last year. So I mean the numbers. So we had a I think a minus nine and a half alpha in January this year, whereas we had a plus thirteen alpha. So this is our performance versus the benchmark. We had a plus thirteen. Um, January in, in 2023. So you're dropping a uh, you're dropping a plus 13, and you're substituting a plus 13 with the minus nine and a half. And of course, that changes the the annualized numbers um, very drastically. You'd see the same actually over over three years. It wasn't driven by a single factor. In fact, most of our shares were down this January, as opposed to January last year, where where most of our shares were up. I think there are some some very important points to, to keep in mind. Um, the, the first thing I would say is that we invest with, with high conviction, um, which of course means that um, at times our portfolios will be very concentrated. Um, and by design, we are very, very different to, to the benchmark or very different to our, our peer group. Um, so high conviction, high concentration, very different to the benchmark. What does that mean? Well, it means that in the short term, unfortunately, there will be there will be more volatile volatility. Um, in fact, I think volatility is often a feature actually of a of a of a truly contrarian portfolio because you're buying shares that are by their nature misunderstood, unloved, um, etc. Uh, I I've often said that in the short term, volatility is often the price that you unfortunately have to pay for long term outperformance. I think the key message is um, to ignore the noise. The longer your time horizon, the less the, the volatility actually matters. So if you can condition yourself or if you can condition your clients to focus less on the short term, I think not only will you sleep better, um, and be happier, but actually your, um, your investment outcomes will be vastly improved. And I guess at the end of the day, you know, what we look at, we look at the long term, both when we assess companies, when we make investments, when we assess our own performance. Since inception, I think we've added around two and a half or so percent of our performance after fees versus the benchmark before fees. Um, so our numbers after fees um, 
And we can see in our clients how big a difference that's made if you compound that over, over 15 or so years. So we, we think that's the most important thing to, to keep focusing on. Like I mentioned in my introduction, uh, finding really good companies at good prices. Uh, my next question also speaks to one of the questions from the audience. Uh, we've had we've heard very strong arguments for uh, uh, quality or growth, uh, also for index investing. Yeah, uh, you are contrarian value, uh, given your DNA as well, where you come from. Uh, yeah. We've seen how it works over time. But bluntly put, why add value to a portfolio now? Well, we're finding incredible value. I mean, in fact, um, I mean, that chart I showed you, we are finding shares and we, we showed you, but three, I mean, the list is incredibly long. The delivery companies, for example, that we own, um, a company like Justy Takeaway was trading at 110 euros a share um, a couple of years ago at the peak is now trading at 14. I mean, and is, is a far better, far bigger business now than it was then. Um, so we think markets are anything but efficient. Um, I think the challenge is that people are incredibly, in fact, when I say people, market participants on average are very, very short-term focused. You're seeing a bad quarter, and on a bad quarter, you're seeing share prices move by 35 or 30%. I mean, it's not unusual. Um, and we think, you know, the, the more we see, and, and in fact, those, those sort of, you know, are becoming sort of even, even more acute now with indexing and things having become a bigger part of the pie, something that attracts a little bit of flows, attracts a lot more flows just because now it's in an index or whatever. And you're seeing the reverse of that too. Um, so I think the, the more of that short-term type of behavior we're seeing, the more excited we actually are, despite, so as I said earlier, short-term noise, the more excited we actually are about long-term value, companies that are trading at very low multiples where you don't even have to look too far out. You, know, you don't have to look 20 years out. You can look two years out and you're seeing tremendous amounts of value. Um, and that, that, I guess, keeps us, um, keeps us very excited. And I mean, you can't time these things by all means. So it's no, a good I time. I wish we could. Oh, it's a good time to get in. Uh, very last question from the audience, uh, from Martin. Uh, your offshore drilling companies, you sold out of us drilling companies. Uh, he recalls being that one of your big positions about six months ago. Uh, how did your views change on these stocks? Yeah, I guess for us, the challenge is always finding relative value. I think we still think those companies are attractive. And in fact, we, we still own four or five percent of our fund is, is invested in those drilling companies. And in fact, the thesis that we had two or three years ago is pretty much playing out. Um, now, un unfortunately, those drilling companies have done very well for us. In fact, they're our biggest contributor to performance over three years since COVID. Um, and as I showed you on those charts, we are finding other shares, you know, as the drilling companies have gone up, we're finding other shares that have, we think, become better businesses, but have fallen tremendously and are even more out of favor than, for example, the drilling companies may be now. So I guess it's all a matter of where are we seeing relative value? And unfortunately, we have to sell and, and be pretty unemotional about it and dispassionate and selling a, a cheap share if we are finding other shares that are that are even cheaper. Tom, thank you for that. I'm going to finish off with that. Uh, I do apologize for audience. We ran uh, slightly over time, uh, but I kept it going. It's very insightful indeed. Uh, I think a lot of questions that we answered today are coming from your clients or the investors as well. Uh, there is a good universe out there. And the point that I made in the beginning as well, finding these top quality managers is key in good performance for your clients. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, to all our presenters as well, fantastic content. Uh, we can see the passion in terms of what you do uh, in terms of your presentations and your performance numbers. So thank you so much for that. Uh, to the BCI team, Tanya, Olga, thanks for always setting up these sessions. We appreciate the work you do. We look forward to seeing you again next week, Wednesday. The 14th of Feb, yes, we'll bring the roses, uh, where we'll be joined again by a group of international fund managers, fund managers the likes of GKG, Fundsmith, Lindsay Train, and more.
See you next week, Wednesday at nine. Simon, again, thank you so much for closing off for us today. It's really great thank to you, have Gene. you with it's a pleasure. us. And we'll chat to you again in the near future to our audience out there. Thank you for your continued support. We'll see you next week, Wednesday. Thank you.